Screaming Truth at Power. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice to get it. Man, did you get it on? Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you. We love that Brad Williams is in studio. Hello, sir. Got so much to get into, but uh, here's a rando thought, Brad. Yes. That you uh, might have some thoughts on. Whenever someone says that, I'm like, all right, what dwarf killed someone? Nope. Zero dwarf talk. <laughs> Ooh, zero dwarf talk, which is not a podcast that I would be booked on. He's not going to know how to answer this. <laughs> this uh, this uh, has nothing to do with that, but it's a, okay. it's a, it's a, and we have some dwarf related stories coming up, so don't worry about oh, it. Thank, <laughs> thought. thank not God. I'm like, thought. I, 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 I got to wet my beak. I see. <laughs> I, I've always had this theory, which is fireworks aren't really inherently dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's your relationship with fireworks. Mm. And so I always would tell the story of when you got your first M80, Black Cat or fireworks, you know, firecracker as a kid. Yeah. Your very first one, you go, we're going to put this thing over there in the sand, and then I'm going to light the fuse with a long stick, and then we're all going to run. Right. Right. And then it goes off. Yes. But about two hours later, you're like, I'm going to shove this M80 into a gourd. (laughs) I'm going to hold it like a football. Right. You light it. Right. I'll wait for the fuse to go down. Just a little bit. So so the timing can be perfect. Right when it gets to the middle, I'm going to chuck a spiral and that thing's going to blow up all over the beach. And at some point, that's when the hand gets blown off. Yes. Because it is not good enough to just light it in the sand and run anymore. You right. have to put it in a mailbox. You have to wait for the fuse to go down. Mm-hmm. Then you shut the mail. Then you get shrapnel in your neck. Mm-hmm. Okay. It, it, it's very much like the first time, you know, uh, uh, you fart and then and then you're like, oh, that oh, that's pretty good. And then you and, and, and then you have a fart coming up and you're like oh that's really good and then and, it's, and now you're like okay now how how big of a fart can i get before before it's a shart yes before, it's exactly I, the same it's been said a million times i know so then i was thinking about that's really where the hand gets blown off with the fireworks it's yes. never the first one it's the fifth one and you're trying to up the ante yes and then i started thinking I think this is exactly the same way people die skydiving. Because Ah. your first dive is a tandem dive. Yes. You got some ex-military guy who's done 2,000 dives strapped to you. Yes. And the chute is automatic, and it's going to go off at 5,000 feet, and you're just along for the ride. And it's probably the safest thing you can do in terms of skydiving. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, you got to up the ante, right? <laughs> and then at some point, you're standing up on top of El Capitan yeah. or Half Dome, yeah. and you're holding the chute in your hand. You're like, here we go. And you're go. like, I'm going to get a run and start, and <laughs> that's where you die. And then you If tur- you just kept it to the tandem leaps, yes. you would never die. I'm fine. But you got at some point, you got to turn, double bird the camera <laughs> right. as he's jumping Do with you. Do a half gainer, and then <laughs> yes. I'm going to throw. The, I'm not even going to release the chute. I'm throwing it yes. out with my free hand. Yes. And who packed the shoot? Well, me while I was drunk, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> who packed the shoot? My fist. <laughs> I'm holding this thing like a duvet cover in my right hand. Yes. I'm just going to toss it out. And of course, it doesn't catch the wind right, right. And then you plummet to your death. But fireworks, mm-hmm. not inherently dangerous, and, and neither are skydiving, but once you got to keep going, yes. that's where the danger comes in. That's man. Yes. That's humanity. Has uh, has our mutual friend, Kevin Ryder, mm. ever told you his story about skydiving? Kevin of Kevin and Bean. Kevin and Kevin and Bean. Has no. he ever told you a story? So, <laughs> no. he, so I don't think I he'll mind. I know he's done it, I think. Well, that's the thing. He went. <laughs> he went to go do it. I believe he was doing it in Arizona. I could be getting the location wrong. And, I, and I'd love to... Arizona makes sense because yeah. he's from there he's from and I there. remember that. And so the, the story he told me is that he was walking towards the plane to go skydiving. And then all of a sudden you hear... Oh, Somebody what? hit the ground. Somebody hit the Holy ground. Shit. Wow. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> right near him. And then they all Time everyone, around. everyone looked at each other and went, you know, I think another day. Maybe, oh, yeah. may, may, maybe another day. So, yes, that now – I don't. Uh, he may have told me the details of that person. It may have been one of those. It's their first single dive. It's a half gainer. They passed out. Whatever. But uh, after he told me the the initial, as I'm walking to the plane, you see the splat. Unbelievable. He's like, I was out. I was yeah. tuned out. The racing the days since last him. accident. To yes. Get back yeah. to uh, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> <You> just <laughs> now, I'm gonna go skydiving. You are. But. Uh, I'm doing a show in uh, Charlotte, and uh, a guy hit me up on Instagram, so you know he's legit, <laughs> and, and uh, he tells me he's part of the Golden Knights, and mm. uh, the, the, the Golden Knights are the nation's elite skydiving force. It's the best of the best of the best. That's like, the army, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, uh, or the Flying Knights, I may be giving the no, term wrong. I think wrong. the Golden Knights. I, I, I think it's the Golden Knights, but uh, I looked into it, and yeah, he is, as long as he's that guy that... Mm-hmm. You know, I looked up on s- is, several yeah. different sites. Yeah, so I'm like, that's that's how, to, to speak to your point, that's how I will go the first time <laughs> with the mm-hmm. Golden Knights guy who can jump and land in a chimney and, and, and with his gun pulled out and <laughs> pop off a couple terrorists. That's the guy I want to go with. But then, yeah, hopefully I stop there and don't get to the full, like, it's, you know, you're in Palm Springs and you're just, like, you're drunk off your ass and you're like, yeah, let, yeah, let's go. Let's do, let's do it. I can do a solo. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, in my experience, mm-hmm. the scariest part, I mean, I think the real threat of the skydive is the airplanes they use. Like, if you've seen the airplanes, they look like some of those yeah. Winnebago campers that are parked yeah. out of L.A. with just wings right. yeah. coming off them. Like, you know, they always do that thing where they go, well, everyone thinks race car driving is dangerous, but mm-hmm. they're in a cage and they have fire suppression system and helmets and everything. Like, the yeah. most dangerous part is to drive to the track. You know, for, <laughs> I feel that way about skydiving. Yeah. I think the most dangerous part is that Rick, they have some old mothballed planes, some mm-hmm. surplus planes. It looks like planes. planes go to die. Yes, they yeah. get them. They look. They don't even look full plane. They look sort of half camper, half plane. Those, <laughs> that takeoff in altitude that is the scariest part of skydiving to I, me. I guess the thing that makes you go, I'll be okay, is that you're like, well, I, well, I have a parachute on me. Right. So, like, that helps. So, so like, if, it go, if it's going down, I just jump out and I got a parachute. It's the wheel coming off when they're taking off mm-hmm. that, where the parachute's not going not yeah. to help you. Right. Yeah. But so, it, yeah, it looks like a plane that already needs to offload some weight. Yes. Yes. All right. So, some point uh, it smuggled some drugs. That's that story. The other one that I wanted to get your uh, take on. Okay. It's making. Oh well, I I should uh, unfinished business. Uh, so Jimmy Kimmel's in an epic battle yeah, with Aaron this. Aaron Rodgers online online. Yeah. Um, and there's been some lists that have come out and nobody knows who made the Epstein list. I wouldn't trust those lists very well. Uh, it's but always I mean, like, like the source too. It's like, cause it, I, I'm, I'm refreshing Epstein list like every few hours be like, all right, right. who's on this <laughs> son of a bitch. But then like every, like sometimes they post list, but then it's fine. You, you, you find out it's rich, Twenty four seven three six five eight nine two on Twitter, and you're like, okay, well, that I don't know if not that's a credible the source. Best I go source. skydiving with that guy, yeah, but I'm not yeah, gonna yeah, trust yeah. His but I'm not, but I'm not trusting his Epstein list. Well, and it's also like the list has Whoopi Goldberg and Tom Hanks on it and stuff. And again, as I've explained to, uh, as I explained to my son when he was asking me about this, like I was like, look, it's all about the island. It's not about the plane. People are such whores. When you <laughs> offer somebody a private flight somewhere, they jump in. I said Who's to my saying son, no. I said to my son last night, we've been on Mark Garagus's plane a yep. million times. He's like, yeah. I was like, all right. Who knows what Mark Garagos is really up to? You know what I mean? It's been I said a million times. Well, Mark I don't, Garagos. I look, he's a dear friend, but I don't put anything past him. Yeah, we're it's not tracking his he, flights. He defended Michael Jackson. He defended uh, Scott Peterson. You know, sure. you may not like the man. <laughs> yeah. You know, but that doesn't mean my son. Yeah. 
who's deadheading it on the way to New York or Las Vegas or Phoenix with Mark on his plane has anything to do with Mark and his actions off of that yes. airplane. Someone right? comes to you and says, oh, uh, so-and-so's got an island and, uh, you know, uh, the, these other people have flown with them. And, uh, yeah, he'll take you on a private jet to the island. You're not stopping me like, is this a pedophile island? <laughs> Well, I like you don't stop and question. I think there's a separation between the plane and the island. Mm -hmm. If you're catching a flight from D.C. to New York on a private jet with your kids and your wife or whatever, that's got nothing to do with anything. I mean, Mm -hmm. you you could you could say, well, you knew who Epstein was. Maybe you did. Maybe you didn't. You could be a conscientious objector, but. Everyone's taking that free flight. I was on a tour bus one time. But the island may be different. And they said it was Tom Petty's tour bus. Right. It was his old tour bus. And now, do I know, like, not saying Tom Petty is Epstein. I'm not saying that at all. But, like, just because I'm flying in his tour bus doesn't mean I'm endorsing everything that he's done in his whole life. Although Tom Petty's a bad example because I kind of do. Yeah. (laughs) When we played the Mysterious Theater in Vegas, uh, Mm -hmm. my band opened, and we were, like, the second band to ever play that theater because they only have the Cirque du Soleil show. So they're like, yeah, we need a big rug for you guys because otherwise this ground isn't going to work for, like, the drum kit. So we have one rug in the back. It's Bill Cosby's rug. (laughs) Do you want it? (laughs) And I thought about it. I'm like... Yeah, I want that. <laughs> yeah, yeah need it's that rug. Bill Cosby's rug. <laughs> now, it, it, it's got various other it's fluids the, baked into it. Bring and, out the uh, Cosby rug, yeah. Yeah, if you ring it out, you might still get a couple of quaaludes, but yeah, it, it's Bill Cosby's Why rug. Why do they even need to announce that? I don't know. Yeah, They're just Bill like, Cosby's yeah, we have one rug, rug in the back. The only guy who's ever needed a rug was Bill Cosby when he performed here. Will you use it? Miss, you need a hat? Yeah, <laughs> this is Ava Braun's hat. <laughs> <laughs> it's still cold. I, I do want a hat. Like, why do you have to even announce that? Hitler's know. scarf. That's right. <laughs> All right. So uh, Aaron Rodgers, I think we have a clip. Yeah, this yes. is him on the Pat McAfee show. Yeah. Does that have something to do with the Epstein list that came out? <laughs> feels like it. feels <laughs> That's like That's supposed to be coming out soon. That's supposed to be coming out soon. Look, this guy's been it's waiting in his wine people. cellar. Yeah. I've been waiting in my wine <laughs> cellar for this thing. <laughs> a lot of people, including Jimmy Kimmel, are really hoping that doesn't ah, happen. Please. <laughs> All right. All right. Obviously, a clip from this particular program was run on Jimmy Kimmel's show uh, whenever Aaron brought up the, the list and then Jimmy mocked him for it. Mm-hmm. Aaron has not forgotten about that. But here we are sitting right in front of that nice bottle of scotch. Mm-hmm. What do you say? I'm waiting to celebrate something. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's awesome. been waiting That's for the that. one. <laughs> you been waiting for hey, I'll tell you what. If that list comes out, I definitely will be popping, popping some sort of bottle. All right. So, listen. By the way, doing a... Zoom from a wine cellar. Yeah, that is a yeah. that is a power move. That's some white privilege right that there. Wow. It's, it's actually red privilege. Yeah, Bordeaux. <laughs> well done. Uh, I, I I am telling you that I have traveled extensively with Jimmy Kimmel, and if you're into something, you find out when you're traveling with the person. Mm-hmm. I've traveled with other people. I won't use their names, but. They'll have an app of where they can get handies and, uh, you know, happy endings and stuff like, you know, you're going to be in Toronto for three days. Yeah. And you're going to need a happy ending. Like, that's crazy. What's the name of the app? People <laughs> <laughs> Helping Hand. Oh, okay. Yeah, well look that up. I'll download it. No, I just mean, like, when you travel, your thing comes out that doesn't really come out at home. Like, mm-hmm. if you like to drink, you may not be drinking at noon if you're hanging around with your wife and kids at home. But when you're on the road, you will say, hey, bud, let's go get a beer. The show's not till seven, you know? And when you say beer, you mean five beers, but whatever. Like, or like, even stupid stuff like movies you wouldn't have seen, you will go see them because you're, my you're, thing. You're, yeah. you're on you're on the road. Mm-hmm. Um, when you travel, and I've been to Jamaica and I've been, stayed in Goldfinger's like a lair and stuff over there. <laughs> like there's compounds and yeah. stuff like that. I've traveled with Jimmy. Yeah. If this was his thing, I would know <laughs> you it. You would know. I yeah. I would know it because it would either be a conversation or it would be where's Jimmy? Right. And then it'd be like, he's not doing dinner tonight. Jimmy's he's getting lost he's kinda, all the time. <laughs> he just wants to see the town. <laughs> you know, he'll be back at two AM. So 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 you're saying when you were on a private jet with Jimmy Kimmel, the stewardess never came by and said, uh, vodka for you, Mr. Corolla and uh, uh 
young seven year old boy for you, Mr. Kimmel. Like not, never said anything not like that. His thing. Okay. He is the most decent person I've ever met. It, nobody likes kids in a healthy way more than uh, more than Jimmy, and it is just not in his DNA. So right. this is one hundred percent about nothing. Can I read his? Uh, yes, you his can read his to response. Aaron Rodgers. Mm-hmm. So yes. he, he quoted that video and said, "Dear asshole," with two A's for Aaron. Uh, for oh, the, <laughs> I didn't even catch that. For the record, I've not met, flown with, visited, or had any contact whatsoever with Epstein, nor will you find my name on any list other than the clearly phony nonsense that soft-brained wackos like yourself can't seem to distinguish from reality. Your reckless words put my family in danger. Keep it up, and we will debate the facts further in court. And then he tagged Aaron. Yeah, well, I agree. And, uh, you know, we're living in... a. Uh, I, you know what I don't like? I don't like when fake news is is fake news. Like yeah. what I'm saying is, is there's a lot of misinformation that turn out to be true. Just say about a subject like COVID or Hunter Biden's laptop or any of the stories that have been going around January 6th or whatever. This is fake news. Jimmy Kimmel's the most decent person I've ever met. Hey, I like I said, I would know it because uh, we've traveled extensively, been in plenty of uh, exotic locations, mm-hmm. and there's this is way before the ring doorbell was invented. <laughs> so you could kind of do whatever you wanted, and uh, that guy's you know early to bed, early to rise, and uh, let's let's work. One thing I love about a you you defending Jamie is because because you're a friend, you know the man. But also, I think it's safe to say that you and Jimmy Kimmel uh, probably don't agree politically on absolutely everything. But I think this is a good message to to people out there because, yeah, you can have people in your life that don't agree with you on certain aspects politically. But as long as they're good human beings, they they care about their family, they pay their taxes, they don't have a rape dungeon. Yeah, uh, I feel that you can get along right. with that person. He didn't say Jimmy didn't have a rape dungeon. Oh, so no. no. Bra- breaking yeah. news. He's got <laughs> pizza ovens, but he doesn't have rape dungeons. Okay. okay. Get, All right. Get that hashtag. The other going. thing, I'm curious where both you come down on on this one. Pro pizza oven, that's for sure. Um <laughs> these people, and there's a lot of them out there, and uh I'll try to leave the names off, but um let's just say people people close to me mm-hmm. uh had a little Christmas uh gathering mm-hmm. and at some point a dude walked th- in And he presented me with a bottle of scotch. Okay. And um, I looked at the label, and it was called uh, Bear Fight. And I said, oh. Good movie. (laughs) I think that's uh, that's Seth MacFarlane's brand, isn't it? And then the woman, who should go nameless, it was about 10 feet behind, just yelled, no. (laughs) Which... Everybody does all the time to me, and it's not based on anything. Now, first off, there's no context. Well, first off, there's yes. one person in this cul-de-sac who's friends with Seth MacFarlane. Yes. Guess who that person is? <laughs> That's this guy right here. That's me. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I'm also the successful and very accurate guy. So when I say something, you should probably stop. But I still never speak in absolutes. I don't go, that's 100%. I go, I think that's Seth MacFarlane's brand. Guess why? Because this guy is the only guy at the party who has interviewed Seth MacFarlane about his brand of scotch, which is called Bear Fight. But because the person yelled no, (laughs) I then said, well, let me double check because it sounds familiar to me. Yes. And then we... uh, also, the people that yell no act like there's no internet. Like, yeah. Person that yelled no, I'm not going to say to you, well, we're going to have to wait till the library opens. Right. Uh, Find Monday. An index oh, card. no, wait. Monday's New Year's. Uh, Tuesday, <laughs> we're going to go down to the Glendale Library eight days from now. Yeah. We're going to settle. Nope. It's in my hand, bitch. Yeah. It's in my hand. I can settle this. In 37 seconds, then you just go Seth MacFarlane, booze, up oh, there it is. Hey, it's the same label. Yeah. Guess who's right? Yep. So um, I then, uh, at some point, but this is how nobody learns anything. Mm-hmm. At some point, I verify it, and then you get this super satisfying experience. 
I'm going to circle back to that person that yelled no yes. and explain to them why they're wrong. Now, and when, then you they act, that, they act, when, when you did that, when you did that, no doubt, no doubt, she said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. Yep. I apologize immensely. Never going to happen again. How Won't dare again. I do that? I should have known. I misspoke. I mean, that's probably what she said I'll after you, pre- after you yeah. presented her with the evidence. It's like you were there. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's always a dismissive. Yeah. What? So what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Why you bother me? And it's like right. So that and that, that by the way that enables you to yell no next yes. time. Yes. This thing happens, and then I realize it's kind of an impulse because I come from a family of of these mm-hmm. these people. I was hearkening back how you know, it's passed on through the generations. I was thinking back on my grandmother the time I was trying to explain to the table about the San Gennaro feast and uh, how we put kids through college and raise money and Tommy Lasorda shows up and my my grandmother panicked and yelled, John Bon Jovi gave a million dollars to Katrina relief. Yes. Which then shifted the subject to John Bon Jovi and away from whatever accomplishments or relationships I might might have. And then um, I realized that my mom would then do that a lot too. But what it what it what it does is it it's it's not only a denial and uh first thing they beat out of you at the growlings, but what it does <laughs> is it doesn't allow you to have the conversation where you go, you know Seth McFarlane? Yeah. You go to his house for Christmas every year? What's he really like in person? Or sure. uh, what do you know? Or, oh, you uh, you did the family guy. Tell us about that. Like, you, <laughs> it, 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 yep, every conversation is gone, Done, yeah. nullified, <laughs> moving on. Yes. Uh, I've actually had these moments, Adam Carolla, ta- mm-hmm. talking about you. Mm, because with, I will with be... With one of my family members? Yes. Because uh, <laughs> I will be in certain... Certain circles, not comedians, but just, uh, you know, my my friends and family. And I'll be like, oh, I'm going to go do the Adam Carolla show or I just appeared on the Adam Carolla show or I, I have an Adam Carolla show mug at, mm-hmm. at my house that I'll drink of. And some people say, oh, Adam Carolla, he and then they'll say something about, you know, I go, no, 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 that wasn't him. All right. <laughs> and then and then they say, no, that was I mean, oh, OK. I know Adam Carolla. I, I just told you I was on the Adam Carolla show. Yes. And then your imme- and then your immediate response is, well, I obviously know the man more than you. Yeah, there's mm. a lot of that. I'm not sure. I don't know where what motivates it, but I also don't know how it serves you. Because it's not like you walked up to this lady who challenged you about the scotch and went, "Hey, truth or truth or false? Is this Seth MacFarlane scotch?" All you said was, "I believe that is Seth." There, there, there was no purpose for her to yell out. No one, if she hadn't yelled out, would have been like, "Well, tch, Amanda never corrected him." Like, right. like no one would have said that. It, so one time, I was at the, uh, I, I was at the Helium Comedy Club in Buffalo, New York. I will never forget this. And I was doing a joke I used to do about uh, about drunken whores. Okay, mm-hmm. and I was doing that joke. I don't know why I said that. Like N- Norm Macdonald, <laughs> hey, 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 drunken whores. Oh my god! Uh, but uh, I, I did a joke about drunken whores, and then a, a woman yelled out from the other side of the stage, "Hey, you shut up!" <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> "Wait, what?" <laughs> All right. <laughs> and she, and summoned like, her, and she's like, "That's no, that's not true." And I'm like, "Wait a minute." So you just heard drunken whore, and you got offended. What are you <laughs> saying about yourself? Because at no <laughs> point, if you would have shut up, would anyone would have looked at you and been like, "Well, Cheryl, he's obviously talking about you." Right. Like no one would have said that. But I said drunken whore, and you went, "Hey." Like what compelled you? Right, exactly. Why? What compels you to give this uh, this information that nobody even wanted and needed? And it's it's wrong. Yes. Well, in her case, maybe right. But <laughs> my uh, so my grandmother, her her claim to fame is getting me off of the uh, feast of San Gennaro and okay. shifting toward John Bon Jovi. Yes. Who nobody in the Corolla family has a personal relationship with whatsoever, sure. but. I realized it was a trait that was passed down because uh, uh, people listening have heard this story, but uh, maybe Brad hasn't, which is I, I, I defy anybody to top this mm-hmm. in the uh, dismissive mom department. I think I know this story. 
My mom walked into my home 13 years ago waving a VHS tape above her head, yeah. which she's never done in her life. <laughs> she never, I've never even talked to my mom about comedy or yeah. comedians or personalities ever because that's something I'm into. And so she's, you know, fundamentally opposed <laughs> to it, right? But she... Um, but also, it's a it's a thing, and I think just sort of globally, and I'll I'll circle back. There is a good way to learn about things. Like toward the end of my mom's life, uh, we were sitting around, and uh, she said, "Like, oh, what are you doing?" or something. I said, "Well, I'm going to Laguna Seca to do a car race," and she's like, "Okay." And then we start talking about muffins. And then at some point, when you get a little older and your parents get old, you just go, "This is going to be my last chance," you know. Yeah. And at a certain Why? point, I just stopped and I said, "Do you want to know?" anything about this race or what kind of car I'm driving or what it is. And mm. she goes, you know, I don't know anything about cars. And I thought, all right, then you can go to your grave without knowing anything about cars. And by yeah. the way, you don't know anything about cars. That's why you should be asking yes. these questions. Yes. But she's waving the tape over her head. And there's so many different layers to this onion. The first one is, is I've been in show business at this point for 17 years and I'm on comedy central and she wants to know if I've ever heard the name John Stewart, which that's the first one. I love, I love that. We're on the same network. We're on the same network, Sad. Mm -hmm. but okay. Uh, have I ever heard of John Stewart? Uh, I say yes, but I learn not to get trapped or baited into a, a conversation. that's going to end up with me sure. stepping on a rake. So then she says, uh, oh, man, I love this guy. This is him on Oprah. I mm. taped him on Oprah. Wow. And uh, I think we tape? should watch it okay. today because that's how powerful and important this comedic mind is. And I go, okay. But I'm still not entering the sure. conversation because, sure. again, it's not going to end up well. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so she's saying, you got to see him. He's thought provoking, but he's funny. He's all the things you guys know John, John Stewart is. Yep. But uh, I'm not going to say that we're friends, and I'm not going to say we're on the same network. And sure. I'm sure he's not going to hell going to tell her we have the same agent, which is James <laughs> Baby Doll Dixon. <laughs> so I say nothing, but she keeps talking. And at mm -hmm. some point, my wife can't take anymore, and she blurts out, you know, Adam's friends with John Stewart. They have the same agent. They're on the same network. Adam, when he goes to New York, we'll get pizza with John Stewart. Mm -hmm. And my my mom pauses and goes, "Yeah, he's a little hit and miss." And then we never watch the tape, yep. and his name never comes up again. <laughs> he hosts the Oscars. Eight months later, my mom watches the Oscars. Doesn't bring his name up. No. Sure, she is. He is dead to her now. Yes. And I thought, wow, what a wiring, and. What a missed opportunity because you love John Stewart and I know John Stewart, so we could talk. We could talk. Yes. It, yeah. It, it, it's... Let's just replace John Stewart with Buddy Epson. <laughs> and I just went. I fucking love Buddy Epson and uh, from the Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah. And, and 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 then someone in the room went. He's a close personal friend of mine. I wouldn't go. He's dead to me. Yeah. I'd go. Tell me everything you need to know. I need to know about Buddy Epson. And to to contrast that to my dad. Saying, "Hey, uh, I was watching Fox News, and th this that Adam Carolla guy, he knows some stuff. Really funny, really informed, very, very funny." Me saying, "I've been on Adam Carolla's show." He didn't say, "You know, he's hit or miss." <laughs> That's right. He, he he said, "Oh my God, the next time you're on his show, please, you know, say hello for me." But but, and I came back. You you signed a whole gift basket for him. Gave him the basket of books and, t and the whole thing. The way it should That's work. That's how it should be. That's if, how it should be. If I was trying to prank you or troll your <laughs> ego, I couldn't do a good a job as your no. mom sincerely did. No. No. It yeah, never, it's, it's impressive. Never brought his and name have up you again. Seen, have you seen that video of Jim Harbaugh's parents after they won the Rose Bowl? Oh, it's I It's the kept, most encouraging. You gotta like, watch. This is gonna be the most the, foreign thing you've ever I seen. I kept seeing the clips. <laughs> I, I saw pictures and stuff, but I didn't. I never listened to it. I didn't, oh, they're getting I didn't interviewed, uh, asking about uh, how they feel about winning the, the Michigan winning, winning oh, the Rose Bowl. We'll, it, we'll get it in a second. Um, it, it, it's just the absolute opposite. <laughs> yeah, of it, every like this is going to shock you. I mean, 
you're not gonna you're not gonna understand what's going on. My yeah, my mom would tell me that uh, b- uh, before my dad sadly passed away, like the last six months of his life, he would sit in his chair and just say, "Alexa, play Brad Williams," and mm. li- and listen to my comedy, and that's just like, holy shit, man, I did it. And now. The, well, o- the opposite of that. <laughs> to, be, to be fair, my dad did hang out and say, Alexa, let's listen to Brad Williams. <laughs> so I did catch him listening to set of yours once. <laughs> then I told him we were friends, and he said you were a little hit and miss. And a little hit and a, miss. That was I, the last time. Not really into dwarf comedy. <laughs> Jesus. All right, do we have this? I got other. Oh, we got this clip. Oh, yeah, oh this is. This is Harbaugh's. Well, parents. first of all, by the way, his dad looks exactly right. Like him. Yeah, he looks exactly yeah. like Jim Harbaugh. He's already smiling. So yeah. This is already foreign to Adam. Your son talks about the two of you all the time. He's talked about this moment coming for this program for a long time. How do you put into words your emotions right now? Are you kidding me? <laughs> they won! What's better than that? <laughs> we have a thing in our family that we'll use for a long time. And it goes like this. Who? Better, better than us. No bottle. <laughs> I know you get tense during these games. Were you on the edge of your seat throughout this one? Well, of course. We were yelling and screaming. That's what we're supposed to play in the game was right before the oh long drive. God. Jackie decided that we should switch seats. Oh, my goodness. And I moved oh. to her seat. She moved to mine. And this is the result that we get. All right, so you- You'll have to do that in the national championship yeah. at a certain time, maybe a little earlier in that game. game yeah, oh. for everybody's happiness. Oh, Thank you goodness. so much. Congratulations Thank to you guys. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Sweetest people in the world. Oh, my God. <laughs> Last question. You ever fly with Epstein? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask. <laughs> sure. You got to ask everybody at some point. Yeah, let's <laughs> so, let's contrast that to the first time Kimmel hosted the Oscars and I was riding for the Oscars. And my mom loves the Oscars. Yeah. And uh, I was like, did you watch the Oscars? And she was like, mm, not, not really, not much. And then I said, oh, you didn't watch it? And she goes, it was a little hit and miss. <laughs> The Corolla mantra is, who's better than us? Everybody! <laughs> Jesus Christ. Such a bizarre... But, you know, listen, as I say all the time, I'll be fine. What's yes. in it for you? What? Yes. Don't you want to hear about Jon Stewart? Like, why not? Or Bear Fight? Like, why not? Don't you want any information? Nope. Nope. We're nope. good. Set my ways. Set... <laughs> Set in our ways. Yeah. And I mean, I think, but maybe in contrast to your dad, mm-hmm. I, 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 maybe the leader in the clubhouse quietly could be my dad. Okay. Because every time I visit him, he brings up Dennis Prager and what a fan he is of Dennis Prager. <laughs> and then I go, you know, I made a movie with Dennis Prager. And he goes, yeah, yeah. Anyway, you're going to go out and do any dates or anything with Dennis Prager? And I go, I made a full-length movie mm-hmm. with me and Dennis Prager. We can watch it You right can now. watch it. He goes, never asked the name of it. Never is intrigued. Uh, look, well, to you should fr- watch it and just hold your hand up so you block <laughs> me out when we come onto the screen together. Yeah. Sure. And then there'll be other appearances where he's alone. And right. then you won't yeah. have to hold your hand yeah, up. But I'll hear you. Can someone? <laughs> That's true. Can, so, can, can, can someone do a dub over where they're like just doing somebody else's voice? Mm. Like, can Frank Caliendo come <laughs> yes. in and do someone else's voice over your voice? Yeah. So then he he can hold oh, up no. his hand. I get it. Block he like, you. He likes jazz. We can get Jay Moore to do Tony Bennett. Ah, when perfect. I speak, he Wonderful. can just read a transcript. Hey, Dennis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Christ. You have any thoughts on the, the, the administration process of universities? <laughs> All right, we got one well, more. Speaking of sporting events, oh, though. Sporting events. Um, so, Adam, you were talking about being courtside at the Nets game. Yes. And we didn't yeah. bring this up, but okay. you were featured on the Jumbotron as like a celebrity in Celebrity Row yeah. in Brooklyn. Uh-huh. You know you've made it. You know you've made it. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, there he is. A picture of Adam mm-hmm. sitting, sitting, uh, sitting courtside. The Thankfully, we cropped out the boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we don't need him. Nobody wants to see that. Maybe he took the picture. Um, so, uh, Brad, you're really well known for being on Jumbotrons. I mean, I think one of your dances actually went viral. It did. At the uh, Lakers game. Uh, I, I've, I've had two go viral now. Oh. Mm. I've, I've had one at the Lakers game, which was 
a lot of fun. And uh, then the more recent one, uh, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of the Denver Broncos. Mm. Massive Denver Broncos fan. Oh, you guys are fast. Uh, and uh, the Broncos invited me out to go see a game. Apparently, there's not a lot of celebrity <laughs> fans of the Denver Broncos. They had, they had, they had to go down some roads. Who are the celebrity fans? That it, you know? it, it, it was me and Angela Kinsey from The Office. Oh, great. Oh. Yeah, she's me, awesome. Me and Angela from The Office. And uh, uh, I I got to go to a game. And then they they put me up on the big screen while the game was going. And I guess you could play the clip. And... Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's Brad. Yeah, it's some throwing double the fist pumps. Yes. Yeah. Now, awesome. Here's the thing about this video that's amazing <laughs> the crowd was going nuts, and they're, they're playing Who Let the Dogs Out? I'm lip syncing. Crowd, crowd's going nuts. What I think is more impressive than the dwarf comedian dancing to Who Let the Dogs Out is the guy who's sitting to my left, if you're watching on the right. That man has mutton chops mm. and is lip syncing oh. to who let the dogs out just sincerely sincerely yeah just like jamming oh, this, is the, this is the jam this is my <laughs> tune and here's the thing i know that guy he's a friend of mine i went to the game with him his name his name is rob he is the master distiller for blackened whiskey that is metallica's whiskey no no it's not <laughs> <Am> I... <laughs> no 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 <laughs> Sorry, all right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Blackened with Yes, I know. I've Bla heard. Blackened whiskey. And that man with mutton chops is li yeah. he looks like a colonel in in, in a civil war reenactment. He's in the wrong yeah. year. <laughs> right. And yet he knows the lyrics though who let the dogs out. <laughs> this is a national treasure. This guy is inclusive. Yeah. He is up to date. Mm, he yeah. is he is like you would you would expect to, for him to know every lyric to the Alan Parsons project, mm. <laughs> like right. e every lyric. I, I, if you're playing a Steely Dan song, that man knows that. Now, first lyric. song is iPod Baja Boys. Yeah, not knowing Baja men <laughs> and, and that Baja, guy, not a good Scotch region. That guy either. either. Yeah, you know? <laughs> nobody brews any Scotch out of. Baja. Yeah, it's a tequila. Place. That is a man's man, a good a good friend, and uh, uh, that to me was way more impressive. But it, but it was certainly a lot of fun to get the crowd going. I I do like the fact that under my name on the jumbotron they put comedian just so you knew like oh okay you need the qualifier. <laughs> yeah. He's not just a random dwarf dancing. Oh, okay, there he is, comedian. Okay, yeah, Wonderful. wow. So yeah, that's Rob. And then let's go. Let's watch the Lakers one too. Okay, this is you and Adam Ray. Yeah. This, this one. is from how long ago? Oh, this is uh, maybe like eight years ago, seven, eight years ago. Oh, Adam's wearing a Sonics jersey. And yeah. Brad's. And then this was actually on the broadcast. Uh, they put me on the broadcast. Brad, you're really getting down. Yeah. I, you know what? I think more I, I think more teams should hire me. I oh, think, yeah. I think more teams should hire me to get your crowd going. You put a dwarf on the Jumbotron, that is ratings. Right. And this was like a meme a few months ago, like yeah. everyone is reusing it. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, it went back on the internet. Someone it's timeless. posted it. <laughs> and the thing about that video is um, uh, I won these seats at a, at a raffle. It was mm -hmm. just a raffle. And uh, uh, I got them, got them for pretty cheap, too. And I invited Adam. That that That's my friend. We we, we both like basketball. We, we sit down, and we're clearly out of place. Mm -hmm. Courtside, we're Court looking side. around. We, there's I Chris, don't belong there, here. Yeah. There's Chris Pratt, and there's a bunch oh, of other cool. celebrities. Uh, I, I encounter Chris Pratt that day. I'll go. I'll, I'll talk about that. But uh, yeah, like we clearly don't belong. And the first thing they do is they come up and they're like, would, would, "You know, would you like anything to eat?" And we're like, "Ah, uh, you know, we're you know low self esteem. We're like, <laughs> yeah. we're okay. I don't want the burger that cost you know forty nine dollars or whatever." And they're like. Oh, you don't want anything on Free Food Friday? We're like, huh? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, what, what, what was that? Oh, it's a, it's a Free Food Friday. All the all like the first three rows or whatever just have free food. I'm like, sushi, right? Bring me bring 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 me the sushi. And uh, they did. Cool. It, 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 it was delightful. And uh, at, we we see we, we we see Chris Pratt. And uh, at some point, uh, this is back when we were doing the podcast together, and we we're like, we 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 got to get Chris Pratt in the podcast. And uh, at one point, Chris Pratt gets up. This is uh, after one of the quarters ends, and uh, we're 
there, there's an area for the courtside people so they can go and then like not be in the general pop and they got snacks and food, drinks, bathrooms, the whole thing. So we follow Chris Pratt to this area. We're like, all right, how do we make the introduction? <laughs> and uh, and Chris Pratt then goes to the men's bathroom and and, and I look at Adam and go, don't worry, I got this. <laughs> I didn't have a plan. <laughs> I had nothing. Yeah. I had no plan. I just went, don't worry. I got this. He's like, all right. I walk into the bathroom. Chris Pratt is at a urinal, and uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of other empty urinals, and then there's a very low urinal. And at that very low urinal is another dude who does not need that low urinal. Mm. He's an average-sized man. Mm. And I walk up and go, this is my in. Okay. Okay. I stand right behind the guy and I go, just your luck. You're pissing at the midget urinal and the midget shows up. <laughs> Chris Pratt from the other side just goes and just starts laughing hysterically. I awesome. I mock the guy for a few more minutes and then uh, and then Chris comes over and says, oh, that's funny. And I start talking to him. And uh, as we're walking out, he sees Adam Ray in the Sonics jersey. And uh, Chris Pratt's from Seattle. So then, mm. they, so then oh. they start chumming it up. And uh, we, we exchanged some numbers. And uh, he never appeared on the podcast. But I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that was the Chris Pratt moment. And then at some point, they started doing dance cam. I started dancing. Everyone around me was cheering, going nuts. They, they're... They're putting five year olds on the dance cam. They're putting twelve year olds on the dance cam. You know, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Get out of here. Give him a moment, I guess. Uh, but then, the, we see the cameraman. He's pointed at me, and the crowd's going crazy. Then they cut to me. They put me on the big on the big jumbotron. And the place goes nuts. All I'm trying to say, Detroit Pistons, you just had the record for the most losses in the row. Yeah. You, you got to get your fan base back. Yeah. They need their mojo. You can't. The T-shirt cannon is too old. It's right. not. It's not doing it. Dwarf in a box. Or put you in the T-shirt cannon. Fire up to the uh, upper deck. There you up go. There, I would watch the shit out of put that. Put me in the T-shirt cannon because now they have Gatling gun T-shirt cannons. Get me and uh, I. I don't know what you call a group of dwarves uh, uh, to murder a crows or herd of cows. A reach of dwarves. Get a reach of dwarves. Put us in the Gatling gun. I love it. T-shirt cannon and fire away pistons. You're back. Insurance companies would be fine with it too, because you just <coughs> went skydiving with a golden knife. Yeah, I mean, plus you're we're skilled. Dwarves um, are dwarves are elastic. I'm gonna we're bring. Uh, you're like bumbles. You bounce. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I'm gonna bring this full circle because one of my first outings mm -hmm. was to a Lakers game with Jimmy Kimmel and Kevin Ryder of Kevin and B. Known Epstein supporter, Jimmy and Kimmel. <laughs> we were up in the second loge, whatever, the okay. Lakers game, and I'd been at the radio station for like 10 minutes, yeah. and I was working for free, and I was trying to make my way in. Yeah. So every time there'd be some event, like Kevin would go, oh, he's poker night at Kevin's house and he'd invite Jimmy and then Jimmy would go on well, have Adam come along too because I was trying to ingratiate yeah. myself yeah. and uh, they fired the t-shirt cannon up to the upper deck I got long arms I skied up did the one hand snatch pulled oh. it out of the air Everyone sort of around me sort of went, whoa, it was like grabbing a fly ball foul ball yeah, in the ballpark right. you know, That's great, great there. I got it I pulled it down and I handed it to Kevin. Ah, that was my move. Yeah, that's, that was and my move. And that's what made you the famous man that you are today. That's, when that's people right. look back at a singular moment, <laughs> yes, that that was the moment that <laughs> the catapulted funny, you, literally. The funny thing is about <laughs> whenever... Uh, I love the revisionist history because when everyone's trying to attack Jimmy on the internet, they always sure. go, Adam was the only funny one on that show. He carried Jimmy, you know, blah, 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 which is nice to hear. But uh, untrue, Jimmy did most of the work. That's uh, He was the one reading all the scripts and sitting at his desk uh, late night. Yeah. Uh, all right. We have uh, one more clip to play for you. It's the Star Wars director. I don't know her name, but... Oh, I... Yeah. It's a Charmaine Obeyed Shinoy. Yeah, so it's going to... Pakistan. Wait, is that hey, John Stewart? There's John Stewart. Well, I didn't even know he was on stage for this. <laughs> you did know, you know that? I didn't. I didn't. I saw I it didn't on know a much it, smaller screen. Than I didn't. This. Yeah, I saw it on my phone. I didn't know that was. John I mean, Stewart. Wow, I've heard full it, circle. Yeah, though. I've heard he's a little he hit does. and miss. So let's <laughs> yeah, see. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see what happens here. All right. Here's what is the coming. balance of activating 
a force for change, but also trying to permeate that patriarchy, that power structure? And is that a part of the calculation of your art as well? And, and mm. what's been the Maybe reaction to that? Maybe my mom had a point. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I like to make men uncomfortable. I enjoy <laughs> making men uncomfortable. <laughs> I'll take your clothes wait, off, wait, pause, Not pause. you. Mission just, just not, you not pause you. that for one second. Imagine a man saying that exact sentence. Would he be getting applause? <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy making women uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think there is a clip of Sean Connery doing that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, you backhand a lady. Wait, no. Okay. What, Trebek. Or, uh, I, I yeah. can't do it. Connery. <laughs> applause Fuck. break, uh, you know, for making men uncomfortable. Yeah. Sure. Right. Sure. Sure. All right. Continue. By the way, she's the oh. first woman, first person of color to direct a Star Wars right. film. Okay. We'll be uncomfortable in the movie theater when we see this term come out in two <laughs> years, but go ahead. Absolutely. Um, I like to make men uncomfortable. I enjoy <laughs> making men uncomfortable. <laughs> not you. Just, just not you. Not know, you. Not not you. Not Point you. taken. Point taken. <laughs> but, um, you know, it is important to be able to look into the eyes of a man and say, I am here and recognize that. And recognize that I am working to bring something that makes you uncomfortable and it should make you uncomfortable because you need to change your attitude. And it's only when you're uncomfortable, when you're shifty, when you have to have difficult conversations that you will perhaps look at yourself in the mirror and not like the reflection and then say maybe there is something wrong with the way I think or maybe there is something wrong with the way I am addressing this issue. So uh, this is actually an eight-year-old clip. Wow. So, but, so wow. it's like right, I guess, right in the, the Me Too uh, movement. So I'm, I'm guessing that's why there's just that, that applause break was way longer and uh, larger. They'd, than, yeah, they'd get it now, I the, think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. I, I listen to stuff like this and I try to be empathetic and sort of think like, what do they think? Like, do they really think this? And I do think that they think that men are super in charge and large and, and, and comfortable and think of them as different. And I do think to some, some degree, it's not, it's not much different than the black movement. Like you walk around going, I'm white. I got no problems. I'm in charge. I, I, call, Every day. The, I call the shots. <laughs> and, um, and so what they do is they perpetuate it and then it makes for a bad society, which is yeah. what our society is coming into. So this shrew with her projection. First off, if you took a look at her life, and I have no idea what her background is. If you take a look at her life and you take a look at my life, I guarantee her life had 10 times the privilege that my life had. Now, this would be acceptable to me if I did feel like I had one teaspoon of privilege anywhere along in my life. But the other thing that I think that people and women especially, and to certain degrees, the black community or the Hispanic community or the whatever community. The other. The other community. Yeah. Um, you know, getting back to the subject of the man show, we had tons of women working for us. Mm -hmm. Our two, uh, Lisa Page and Jennifer Heffler, were like the two executive producers who did, sort of, they were like the shop foreman. You know, they mm -hmm. did all the, the heavy lifting. Um, I got along with great with them. We had women directors. We, we had women everywhere on that show. Right. And nobody ever factored in their body parts. It was always like, we don't like that director, but that director sometimes was a man and sometimes was a woman. It was all ability driven. Yeah. It was all a it was it was all based on your contributions. Were you good? Were you bad? How did it work? And we've never even discussed any other facet of it because we'd be fools to. We'd be fools to yeah. be running a business and go, well, the, the woman's really good and the guy's kind of hit or miss, but he does have a cock and balls. And so let's go with the hit and miss guy. <laughs> Whether you're selling cars or doing comedy, you immediately get out yeah. of that business. Yeah. It becomes all performance oriented. Yeah. And, you know, Jennifer Heffler and Lisa Page were good. At mm -hmm. what they did, and they were with us like all all four years, and they had a sofa in their office, and they would let me nap 
in it when I was <laughs> nice. trying to when Ooh. I was trying to escape my casting office. couch. But that's how you got the job. <laughs> there were jobs, and there were part of the jobs were like we had the Juggy Dance Squad, and those were all women because that's that's what that was. And then everything else, our our executives at Comedy Central were all women uh, the whole time mm-hmm. I was there. We agreed or we disagreed with what what it is <coughs> they had to say, but it was never based on anything. And it was it was never like we went, oh, that's a woman. Like, we don't have to listen to her. I think women think that's what mm. guys think. I think black people think that's what white people think. We do not. Um, I've never I would I would venture to say that every woman in my life has had a much better life than my life. <laughs> much better. Leaps in bounds better than my life. And I don't think there's anything I ever got out of being white or being male other than having a strong back so that I could dig ditches on a construction site when I was 19. That is it. And you assholes need to shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up with the race baiting. Shut the fuck up with the feminism shit. Just shut it and let's get to work. Thank yeah. you. I, I will say this is that I had this conversation recently with a friend of mine and because uh, we were talking about the uh, the sequel to Captain Marvel came out and yeah. it was a flop Did not do and well. there was a lot of people saying like, oh, it, it it's because there, 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 there were there were female leads that a lot of men didn't go see this movie. And to that, I would say, no, it's because it was bad. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's because we saw Wonder Woman. And that the first one, and that was great. We 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 went and we watched it because it was a good movie. Yeah. Uh, 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 Black Panther was a good movie. Yeah. Mo- movies with strong female leads that are good, men will support because they're good. It's not that we're not supporting it because oh, I see a I see a person in the lead role that doesn't look exactly like me. I never see a person in the lead role that looks like me. <laughs> True. Dinklage has not been the lead in, in anything. All right. So it's like I I never see myself in a movie. I go see a movie or watch a TV show or listen to a podcast or listen to music, watch a comedian because it's good. Yes. That's why I consume it. And the concept of you need to see yourself is right up there with, oh, he just wants to marry his mom. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to find someone who hates John Stewart and marry them. Like, are you fucking nuts? I would like the exact opposite of my mom. But this notion, the one that the most insulting is when the politician gives a speech and they go, scared of people who look different than them. You know, like, mm-hmm. are you fucking nuts? <laughs> Can you imagine living in Los Angeles, scared of people who look different than you? It'd be horrible. It's, it's all <laughs> insulting and it's pathetic and they should be embarrassed. To by be it. fair, I'm very scared of people that don't look like me because they're larger. They could probably physically dominate me. I'm very, oh, I'm very cautious. Man. I'm very cautious. Oh man, if that, if that mini bike gang had gotten to you, <laughs> although you that would have appreciated the mini bike. Yeah, part. I, dude, if, if I got attacked now, uh, did, did you guys already play this clip like yesterday or yeah, something? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, Ian Ian Ziering got attacked by a, <laughs> a bunch of people on a mini bike. If that was happening to me, I, I would just be laughing the whole time. Like, are you fucking <laughs> kidding me? They had to be mini bikes. <laughs> yes. I couldn't. Oh, I couldn't get attacked hilarious. by regular motorcycles. <laughs> right. they, 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 all these guys, all these guys in the mini bike gang, would just be driving around all day. Like, we're trying to assault someone and rob them, but we haven't found any midgets yet. And then they just find me. They're like, "Ha ha, done it, done." <laughs> all right, we got the uh, news. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll do that right after this. You're about to hear a preview of The Jordan Harbinger Show with the investigator who solved a serial killer case that had gone cold for decades. There was a definite spike in serial predator crime in the 1970s. Joe D'Angelo was a full-time law enforcement officer. He's breaking into houses in the middle of the night, raping women or girls that are home alone that he's binding up and sexually assaulting. He ended up committing 50 of these attacks in Northern California between 1976 and 1979 and just disappeared. The last thing I did in my career before I retired was I drove up and parked in front of his house. I didn't know he was a Golden State Killer, but I debated, should I just go knock on his door? This was such a brazen, brutal predator. He absolutely had to be caught. To learn more about how Paul Holes puts himself inside the minds of serial killers, check out episode 725 of The Jordan Harbinger Show. Here's a little something we left on the cutting room floor. 
for the 2023 Ace Awards, Brad Williams. I did one night in Edmonton, Canada. I woke up at 3 a.m., fly to another country, do a show. I got the 6 a.m. flight back. I am home, back home at about 11.45. And I go, I'm going to bed. I haven't slept yes. in over 24 hours. She goes, oh, but I need some help with the... And I, I'm going to <laughs> bed. And then I showed her the check for one show, for one fucking show. And she's like, okay, that's great. I'm like, that's great. That's 1%. That is the 1% of people that decide to do, you know what, I'm going to do open mic night. And from them to go on to the hosting and to go on to featuring and then to go on to headlining and then to start actually selling tickets. Then for a casino to somehow pay you way too much money than you're actually worth. Don't tell them this. I'm like, I am in the 1% of the people that do this for a living. And you just, all right, you just all right at the 1%. Happy New Year, the 2024 Ace Awards, this December. Let's get back to the Adam Carolla Show. Starfish is the name of the specials available now on Veeps and yeah. also shows coming up. Saturday, Libero Theater in Santa Barbara and then Sacramento at the Crest Theater. Beautiful location. That'll be yeah. January 19th. And then Balboa Theater, January 20th, San Diego. So support a yeah. good friend. Brad Williams. And I'll say this. Comedy the uh, yes. the uh, theater at the Ace Hotel, uh, February 10th. Now, I've been, got, I've been getting this message a lot. People are like, well, the Ace Hotel is uh, closing. Is the show still happening? Yes, the theater is remaining open. So the theater at the Ace Hotel, tickets are available. Get your tickets. I want to play that theater so bad. I saw, I saw Coldplay at that theater. Wow. And now, I, and now I'm going to play it. it, yeah, it, it awesome you're, you're not It's going to be awesome. Now, <laughs> I'm not. I... I agree with you. Now, uh, they just brought that clip from the Ace Awards, which, thank you. Now I'm remembering the fight that led to that rant, so thank you. Uh, but I have a little problem. Oh, I, I, I don't have problems with the Ace Awards. I think the Ace Awards this year were great. I listened. It was awesome. My friend Ted Koppel, though. Mm. He's angry. Mm. Thought he, he thought he was snubbed mm. for, be, for best impression. But I agree. I, yeah, yeah. Because, all right, so what? So what? So what happened? Mm. I lost to Kyle Dunnigan. Well, Ted, I'm not in charge. Kyle fucking Dunnigan. How many Emmys does that guy have? I don't think he has any. Maybe a local. He doesn't have any Emmys. But I'm Ted Koppel, god damn it. No, I, listen, Miss Koppel, obviously we don't have to go through your resume, and especially compared to Kyle Dunnigan's. But I don't have any part in selecting this, the clips, winners or losers. That's a committee. I, I got a beef with you. Well, <laughs> is it because I'm not dirty enough? Is is Ted is Teddy not bringing my Pornhub search history? Do you need something more salacious? Well, we do kind of an adult branded show here, Ted. Yeah, I, I can do that. Did Did you know I'm into BBWs? No, what? Ted, old Teddy boy's into BBWs. That's uh, kind of car. No, something a lot better, and you can fit inside a lot nicer. B B W inside. inside. <laughs> bed and breakfast. Uh, no, it's not a bed and breakfast, but you'll want to stay a while. That's for damn sure. <laughs> I love me some B B Ws. Did did Kyle Dunnigan talk about his love of B B Ws? You uh, want to talk about being inclusive? No, he does have an Emmy for outstanding original music and lyrics from 2015, though. I know, not you have a chest of drawers filled with Emmys, Mr. Koppel. I saying. wipe my ass with Kyle Dunnigan's Emmy. <laughs> oh, wow. I hosted right. Nightline. I uh, know. Listen, yeah. I'm Teddy fucking Koppel. <laughs> mm. All right? Mm. When I go down to the Bunny Ranch in Pahrumpf, Nevada, mm. they have a room named after me. Really? Yes. A lot of BBWing going on out there. A lot of BBWs. <laughs> wow. Let me tell you. I did not. I would have never known just from watching you on Nightline that that was your thing. Yeah. Why do you think I did so much reporting from the inner cities? Oh, oh, black. Black bitches. <laughs> With, damn it. What's the B? Who's the Asian guy over there? Google BBW right Google now. Google BBW. Is that a work computer? Yes. <laughs> you guys really don't know? No, I don't know. Big breasted women. That's BBW? Yeah. I oh. thought I thought I thought it was big black women personally. 
That's oh, what I. That's what I thought. BBW it must, must be it black. Might be the Dawson same. said Preston. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing the odds here, Dawson. Wait, that's, I, that, that go, is a good odd to play. Go yeah, around the I'm room, find myself. out, ask people who work in the office what BBW means. See what they say. I'm seeing Bath and Body Works. <laughs> mm, yeah. I mean, I love a good candle. Build Don't a bear workshop. Build a bear <laughs> workshop. That's, that's what, what I, I was. Thinking. That's what I like. I like build a bear workshop. My mm. favorite kind of porn is bear. sticking a midget <laughs> inside a bear costume mm. and fucking it. Mm. <laughs> they uh. And so what does BBW in the porn parlance stand for? Type it into Pornhub. All right, it is. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm, There's I'm, guys I'm, screaming I'll, at their at their I'm phones both right now. Big black and big breasted women on Pornhub right now. All right, um, I'm not so wrong. It could be both. You, if you just Google it, it does come up with big beautiful woman, but that's not uh. what it was. It was big breasted women. It meant, and it, it was always nomenclature for overweight girls. Listen, uh. I I like big, <clears throat> I like breasts, and <clears throat> I like black. <clears throat> if you could have a big beautiful breasted black woman. Put that in your Dr. Oh. Seuss book. I'll smoke that. Well, maybe a third B is yeah. necessary for you, Ted. Yeah. If you don't mind me calling you by your first name. Not at all. I think we're on familiar terms once I, 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 once, so once I share my Pornhub search history <laughs> of BBBBWs. I forgot to go incognito. <laughs> oh. Shit. <laughs> so, breasted or black? What's the consensus? Uh, there's a Reddit page that said it used to be internet slang for big black women. Mm, that's what Ted's. That's that, where Ted's. That's, that's where from. Ted's at. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. I was in the late '80s. I'm. I'm, I'm wow. Really I like yeah. me some chocolate. Yeah. I agree. Ted sees. Mm-hmm. All right. Should we do a little? Uh, Them news? white women have candy asses. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. Uh. Next year, I'm bringing that trophy home. Yes, yeah. you are. Now, you earned it. Read the news to Ted Koppel. All right, Ted. So, do you know who Natalia Grace is? Natalia Grace, is she a BBW? Uh, no, she's a LBW. She's a little person. Um, yeah, so she oh. yeah, so Natalia Grace Barnett, she there's a there's a documentary called I, I know a what this series is. called The Curious Case of Natalia Grace, where this family adopted a little person. Mm-hmm. Um and and they said that th- they thought she was a child, but she started um showing some. Well, she's weird... from like Russia or something, right? Or she was she from somewhere? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I want to say Ukraine. Uh, okay, Let me double yeah, check that kind of makes sense. That. But um, mm-hmm. but yeah. So she started displaying some weird tendencies to where they started getting suspicious, thinking she's a lot older than they thought. They thought she was like mm-hmm. a six year old girl, and then but they were like, I think she's actually somewhere closer to being like twenty two or twenty three, and mm-hmm. so they were actually afraid of her. Um, they noticed they made like, a horror movie about this story. Well, the orphan, the orphan, yeah, was. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it was based on this exact yeah. story, but it was just weirdly similar. Yeah, mm-hmm. but yeah, so they um, so they noticed uh, that sh- this this girl had pubic hair. Mm. That um, yeah, and they and they were really uh, worried Go on. about her. <laughs> <laughs> Ted, no. Um, anyway, so they basically change her birth certificate to saying that she is twenty three. Now she doesn't really speak English. They gave her like an apartment. They um, eventually she moved into a different guardianship, and they uh, these uh, parents faced charges of neglect of a dependent. And so, they, <laughs> so they, but what happened? So they finally did a DNA test. Uh huh. And it turns out that she was a kid. How do they? Can they tell wow. you how old you are by your DNA? Yeah, there's guess, a. Yeah. There, they use a, a special medical lab that specializes in biological aging based on DNA methylation. How'd they do wow. it? Like sample, cut her open like a tree and count the rings. Like what happened? <laughs> no, they get a saliva sample, mm. and if it has a little snow cone in it, it means you're under ten. <laughs> oh, because okay, nobody okay. over the age of ten eats a snow cone. Unbelievable. What yeah. they did is they put her in front of R. Kelly and they said, right. "Are are you attracted to this woman?" <laughs> <laughs> and he said. Yes. And they're like, oh, she, she is a kid. He Holy does, uh, shit. He did the PPW, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, a PPW. I'm also yeah. into that. Mm-hmm. You don't like a little golden shower every now and then? You know, as a guy who's probably been urinated on way more than I'd like to admit, uh, no. But I, I still, I always stood by the fact that I'd rather be peed on than spat on. I don't mm. know where you guys come down on that. Well, if you, well, if you spit on me. But you call me daddy. Yeah. Now I'm into it. That's right. Yeah, because I don't see people, I don't know, just, 
I find being spit on very insulting. Yes. Whereas being peed on. That's I a think tip of the cap. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of love. <laughs> That's right. I think there's a That's little right. bit of love a there. Love. <laughs> a lot of love there. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. But that saliva <laughs> purely in- insulting. Well, yeah. I mean, you pee. It, Just such disrespect. That's why the adage is you only mm-hmm. pee on the ones you love. True. Yeah. That's right. That's what put, they say. Put oh that on the next heart. coffee mug. Uh-huh. Uh, I have not watched this docuseries yet, but I feel like I have to just so I know what's going on in the world. Because there was like this thing. Yeah. People thought she was an adult little person. Right. That just looked very young. And now, she was faking it. Yeah. Yeah. Now this. Now, don't get me wrong. A version of this uh, uh, can happen, and I had a time where I was at a dwarf convention, and uh, dwarf, dwarf conventions, the organization is LPA, Little People of America, a uh, bunch of little people go into a, a hotel, we, 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 have, uh, we, we have meetings, there's dances, there's sporting events, it's a really great thing, and, but cool. the main purpose of these conventions is boning. You gotta find oh. someone to bone. Yeah, you're 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 friend zone the whole year, and then you go to a convention, and all of a sudden you're hot. Yeah, get at it, buddy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have some fun. Yeah. So there's dances every night, right? And so one night I'm going up to this lady, and I'm just like, I'm I'm about 14 years old, and you know, so I probably just got my pubes at that point, and I and I see this redhead, and I'm like, oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. This lady is something. And I go up and I start talking to this. I start talking. And she starts talking. She's really into me. I'm like, oh my god, this is great. I am really into her. She's really into me. I'm 14. And she goes, Do you want do you want to go up to my room? And I'm like, You have a room? That's awesome. Oh my god, your parents are <laughs> your, your your parents are so great. They, they, they let you have a room. You're so independent. They trust you so much. We're wa- we're walking out of the dance. And uh, she asked me a couple questions, and then I I give the answers, and she goes, "Oh, do, you know, you fly here, you drive here," and, and I was like, "Oh, well, I I, I don't drive." She goes, "What are you talking about? You don't drive because you you can't afford a car?" And I go, "No, I mean, I'm not I'm not old enough." And she goes, "Wait, what?" Whoa. She goes, "How old are you?" I go, 14. How old are you?" She goes, "34." Whoa, wow. dude! I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> wow. and, and 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 she had no idea but to, but to answer your question the sex was great no it, it was not that's a joke uh but yeah that was a moment where she thought i was her age or her uh in my 20s and i thought she was my age right. in, in in my teens so i'm not saying it's impossible mm-hmm. it, it can happen Wow. But uh, yeah, that's be a place where you you should be overly cautious. I think <laughs> at a dwarf right? convention, yeah, yes, very cautious. Do you still get checked for ID? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, but they just check the height. <laughs> you know, you, you walk into like five two. <laughs> no, you're get not allowed in here. here anymore. What are you talking about? But yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm I haven't been to a dwarf convention in a long time. I, I'm back I'm, there. Yeah, I'm probably gonna have to. These are the lessons I, I, I will teach my daughter because she's a little person when mm-hmm. she starts going to these conventions. Always ask for ID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ask for ID. Yeah, you could be like a keynote speaker at the next one. Come on. Speaking of uh, dwarfs, so we had Jay Moore in here yesterday, and he was singing the praises of the uh, Willy Wonka movie. How dare he? Really? So you're How? not going to watch it. You refuse. No. Why would I watch it? Fucking Hugh Grant's an Oompa Loompa? Hugh, Hugh Grant. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm going to be a bit of... Awkward Oompa Loompa. That's what I'm, I'm so sorry. Land. Timothy Chalamet. But, uh, Gene Wilder is my Wonka, and dwarves are my Oompa Loompas. <laughs> Fuck this. The, I'm not uh, going to watch it. I it might be it. great. It might be great. Do not give a shit. I thought you didn't need to see yourself on the screen. You, I, I need, I not at someone else playing me yeah. when, when they said, ah, it's too offensive if dwarves are playing Does dwarves. That what they said? <laughs> Ugh, it's yeah. a whole thing. It was, it, was a, it was a whole thing. It was a thing. It was I mean, a weird land. I saw the movie, and it was a weird land that was half white people and half black people, but they didn't have any other representation of any other nationalities, which is weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but it sort of said to me that the other nationalities don't really matter. Like, you can't make a movie with no black people in it, but you could make a movie with no Asians or no Hispanics or no real dwarves. I don't like that. And, uh, I don't want to live in that was, world. It was weird that, obviously, Timothy's the lead, but the second lead was a black girl, and then, like, one of the villains was a black guy. It was a weird world. It's just black. It was about 80% white, 
twenty percent black, right? In this village, this this mythical village, but there were mm-hmm. there was no other representation, so, which right. is weird. S- South Africa, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like Sun I'm City, Steamboat Willie, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, so it's, you know, I'm 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 protesting that movie. I'm not yes. going to be watching it. It but might good. be good. It you might. doesn't matter. You might like it. Don't care. Timothy okay. does a lot of singing in it, and he's not yeah. really a singer, yeah. so that might slow your roll a little uh, bit but he's okay i mean he he pulls it off but he's right. clearly not a singer nah. but it's a big fat musical i didn't i didn't know it was a musical i sort of i sort of forgot that there was so much song it, this was all yeah. song okay nothing but cuz 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 if you watch the gene wilder version that's a, that's a musical too and yeah. uh it, it's great i love that version but uh so it's not surprising that's a musical, but they didn't really advertise it as one. No, I feel like they thought that may keep a certain amount of Americans at home. Mm. Right. But it's a musical, 100%. Okay. I saw, so I was uh, flying Hashtag home not from, my Wonka. from Scottsdale the other day, and on the plane, they had the movie, they had Willy Wonka, and my wife thought it was the new one, so she was really excited. She watched it. She's uh. watching it. It's the Johnny Depp one. She has no idea. Oh. Oh. I'm just letting her watch it anyway. Just so, I don't need to tell her. Let's just, and she's, to this day, she still thinks she saw the brand new one. <laughs> That's a keeper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in too deep. Yeah, and she doesn't listen to the podcast, so no. you're fine. No, no. <laughs> uh, all right. Um I want to get your thoughts on this. This is kind okay. of a weird story. So police are investigating the first case of rape in the metaverse mm. after a child was attacked in a virtual reality video game. The girl, she was under the age of 16. She's hanging out in, in the metaverse, this virtual reality place with her avatar. Okay. And her character, her digital character was gang raped by online strangers. Wow. Well, whose idea was it to put the <laughs> rape <laughs> button in the video game? Yeah, mm. who put like who's like? All right, we have jump, we have attack, <laughs> and we have rape. Yeah, what? How can you do that in a video game? I like I'm like I don't, I don't know anything about the metaverse. I'm 40. I'm not gonna know about the metaverse. But that Be seems honest. that seems like a flaw in the design of the world. If there is a if there yeah, is I'm a rape right. button, it right. reminds me of the B side by the Baja Boys. <laughs> who let the rape out? Yeah. Who? 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 Who let the rape? I don't know the lyrics to that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's the B side. Ah, That's the B side. Yeah, the B yeah, side. They never B-side. play that one. Munchops Rob doesn't know it either. Yeah, so. that that seems like like okay. A bad on the, the 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 people that did this, but also why why just why does that have the capability of exist? The whole thing about the metaverse is that. You can design it. You, you, it. It's rules. It could be a perfect it utopia, could be a perfect of civilization, utopia yeah. of, of 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 palm trees and beaches, and you know, not rape, no violence, <laughs> no uh, yeah, no it's, stealing. What the fuck? But All I mean, ten every, can every be third video game's a first person shooter thing, right? Everyone's getting shot. Yeah. Anyway, but there aren't even rape buttons in those. Yeah. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto doesn't have a rape button. Right. No. Um, this one does. So, Jesus Christ! So obviously she didn't uh, suffer any physical injuries, and there wasn't an actual physical attack. But officers said that she suffered the same psychological and emotional trauma as someone who's been raped in the real world. Mm. And uh, yeah, so they're uh, investigating it. Yeah. Well, look, if they find him guilty, then they have to go to virtual prison <laughs> and, <laughs> and be they virtually can- raped by a black dude. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this is all very. Very strange. So it, it like obviously it's bad, but then it's like okay, it, it is the same pu- is it the same punishment. I I I don't get it. And oh, this is a controversy. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's a very fucked up statement I'm about to make. People that have actually been victimized by by rape and, and by the the horrible crime that that is. Can you imagine their reaction when? Someone tells him, "Oh no, this woman was virtually raped, but it's the ex- they she suffered the exact same mental anguish that you did." Right? Mm-hmm. What? Yes, I no, <laughs> I agree, I agree, and I, I feel the same way about the sort of bastardization about sexual assault. You know, mm-hmm. like he put his arm on my shoulder in the subway. That's not you being sexually assaulted and yeah. if you are actually sexually assaulted that's very insulting yeah the, to the, hear that. yeah the ones that were going after like i, th- I think it was george bush senior for his they put his hand on her butt when they're taking like, pictures who's my favorite First magician off, david <laughs> copperfield and then can, right. I, can i say this <laughs> there is no sexual assault if you're being photographed 
<laughs> because it flies in the face of people who actually want to sexual assault. The, the people who actually sexually assault people don't go, let's get a crew in here. <laughs> no yeah. one says one, two, three, or say cheese, and then you sexually assault mm-hmm. somebody. Like Al Franken, they made a big deal of it. He took a picture of it on purpose because yes. he was making a joke. Yes. When you're actually, you don't want to chronicle it if in fact you are going to sexually assault so anything that involves a photograph yeah. if it's posed like, not off the table of sexual assault yeah like and then to say that she suffered the exact same like i'm i'm, I'm not saying it wasn't bad for like yeah it could, and, and depending on how old you are playing that game it could it, it could be traumatic and then what but, if like you dreamt of getting raped you suffered emotional uh, trauma as well right, and gotta, you wake up and Blame the Sandman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it. We're we're going nuts. But I, I will say that <clears throat> our virtual lives and our actual lives are starting to coalesce. They're coming together to a certain degree, which is <clears throat> when when I was young, there was no virtual life. There was mm-hmm. just your life, you know. Yes. So you could get raped or you could get in a motorcycle accident or you could get shot, but it all was uh, analog. It happened. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sure. And then people started a virtual life. And I mean, a virtual life is just seeing pictures of yourself and film of yourself over and over doing everything. Like you dancing at the Lakers game from eight years ago, that's your virtual life right. yeah. to, to an extent. It's a yeah. digital version of you. It's the best version of you. <clears throat> yes. You think well, Brad dances in real life? <laughs> no, Throw I'm not. some tunes and find out. I'm not <laughs> saying. Baja, man. <laughs> I'm not even saying it's good or it's bad. It's just thousands of hours of you doing stuff which Mm -hmm. never existed before this generation, Mm -hmm. you know? So you can find, for me, between the ages of zero and 30, there's 11 pictures of me. So literally 11. (laughs) There's not 15. I I hope you're sitting down, but my parents didn't get the wallet size and the Mm -hmm. desk one. As I said, my dad didn't have a wallet or a desk. So where was he (laughs) going to put the pictures, you know, from high school or junior high or whatever? I didn't exist. There was no virtual existence yeah. now i can go online and i can watch a man show bit i can watch me racing a car i can watch an appearance on tucker carlson or something from yeah. four years ago there is a virtual me now mm-hmm. and as we start moving toward this world like every kid is going to have them and then they're going to have their virtual selves yes my kids have tons of photographs and tons of film and footage of them doing everything And so there will be an alternate version of you that is floating around in the cloud that is your virtual self. And now it's going to get skewed a little bit. The lines are going to be skewed. Now, this person's 14. They're playing video games. They're coming up with avatars and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There will be a virtual you, and it will have psychological repercussions on what happens to that version of you. Like, Brad, let's say we took that film of you at the Lakers game from eight years ago. Yes. And some, let's just say LeBron James dropped his shorts and skull fucked you (laughs) while you were dancing. That would hurt your psyche. Don't type that into AI. (laughs) That that might damage your, you might, if you'd had a couple of drinks and you watched that, that could damage your psyche a little bit. That's all all I'm saying. Yes. That's all. A little bit. I'm not saying it's not damaging. I'm saying that in comparison. (laughs) Yeah. That was Um, just an example. It's probably not going to happen. Sure. (laughs) All right. What else? Sorry. Um, So there are these, uh, these travel mugs called Stanley Cups. Mm-hmm. Yes. Dang. Not not the hockey trophy. Right. The best trophy in sports. Right. No, not that one. No. Yes. Th- this is a, yeah, this is like, you know, a Yeti, but this is a, b- these are big uh, travel mugs with a straw and handles are huge and women yeah. love them. Mm-hmm. And so they just came out with limited edition colors mm-hmm. that, you know, they've been posting on social media. Like uh, they came out with red ones that they put out at Target. There's only... They put a limit. You can only have one or two. And um, here, there's a, here's a video of women just flocking. Why do we need seven quarts of water when we're just yeah. living in air conditioning and eating all day? Right. So as soon as Target opened, they sprint. Yeah. They sprint over and they just clear out this rack and they... Uh, wow. You know, you can get women to go... This is... This is... Um, I have this theory, which is 
women don't really need quality. They need other women wanting the thing that they want, and then, then, then they it, well, it's it's the, same, it's the same thing with their men. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's that's. It's Pete Davidson syndrome. <laughs> All you have to do is get Ariana Grande to suck your dick once, yeah. and there'll be a line going out the fucking door to yeah. your house for the rest of your life. That's all you need is another woman wanting you. That's how, and that's why, remember you'd be like in high school or junior high, and you'd be like, that guy, that guy's not even good looking. That guy, and the, mm-hmm. the girls, they love it. They love him because the girls yeah. love him. You have to knock the first domino over, yeah. but that's what, that's what you can get women to do. Yeah. Right. Men won't do that. If it's a stupid travel mug that holds uh, 17 liters of your favorite drink, <laughs> we're not interested. Right. You you can't get me interested just because there's 15 other dumb shit dudes running toward the display. Yeah, when the Pokemon Go thing was happening, <laughs> I never was like, well, I've never looked at a Pikachu once in my life. Right. But all right, Everyone's, now I'm going yeah. out. Like right. I didn't do it for a damn second. So, yes. so these cups are going for fifty bucks now. They're on eBay. For fifty a few bucks. Hundred, yeah, fifty bucks retail, but they're going on eBay for a few hundred dollars because you can get a edition. cup that does the exact <laughs> a fifty dollar yeah. cup. So mm. these are the, the Yeti cups are like fifteen, right? Oh, no, they're, Twenty. They're a little more than that. Yeah, more but, than that. But uh, so these are the limited edition red ones. But now they came out with pink ones for Valentine's Day. Oh boy! And there was a line outside of a Target. Oh, for boy. for uh, for the pink ones at a Starbucks, and a guy wants it so badly, he jumps the counter and steals a box, and and uh, really? we'll play that video too. Yeah, okay. yeah. all right. Let's so see a, that. so a dude did this because probably he's going to just go and resell it. Guys, this right. is insane. So, so this, this woman's just live streaming it. So he Get takes it. He jumps the counter, grabs a box, and he's he's now getting stopped. Wow. Stop yeah. Wow. So this is a smash and grab that didn't work out. Uh-huh. So they won't stop you if you run in and grab a bunch of Louis Vuitton no. pur- purses or whatever. But if you but if you I'm dare for this. if you dare touch a Stanley Cup. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and they stop him. This yeah. guy's this guy's all right now, he's squaring up to the guy who tackled him. I do love it when the guy who's doing the smash and grab is insulted that yeah. somebody intervened. Yeah. Like, what is the meaning of this? Good <laughs> day, sir. I, I'm going to take my top hat and I'm going to lean it forward yeah, and I'm yeah, going to yeah. walk with purpose out was to my chauffeur insane? Bentley. Like, I, look, you can be pissed off, you can be agitated, you can be disappointed, but you can't be insulted that somebody stopped you mid-crime. Yeah. Man, it, the, other, the other thing that drives me nuts about these videos is... A, the person filming, but then all the people filming. Yes. Whenever this shit's happening, like, uh, uh, I saw a video recently of a guy who was at a tailgate, and he and I think I could have been a Buffalo Bills fan because they were jumping through a table or whatever, but it was on fire. Oh, yeah, I saw that. And then he gets set on fire. Right. Yeah. And then everyone just starts filming the guy. He's on fucking fire. Yeah. Yes. Everyone's just like, well, I got to get this. Yeah. I can put it's this like, on the metaverse. Yeah. What? No, put him out. <laughs> right. Stop, drop, oh, and roll. Like, I what felt the that fuck? way with, with Ian Ziering getting attacked. Like, yes. no one's going to stop yeah. this? No. They, yeah. They, so, so, like, you have you the can person. Do it, you can do it with shark attacks. Because <laughs> that you're on the boat. Yeah. You yeah, yeah. Break yeah. lights in the water. People are going to want to see this later. Yeah. What, uh, what, oh, what, what am I going to do? do? Yeah, what am yeah, I going to yeah. do? But like, but, like, the guy's running out, and so many people are... There's there there's eight people filming, one person actually stopping. If right. you could all get together and stop, it's an it's an easy job. Right. But right. then they're all just like, and it's the oh my god, oh my oh my god, <laughs> yeah. Well, somebody should some some human <laughs> some human some being person should please. do something yes. right now. It's stop like, him. You you're right. the person. <laughs> yeah. Also. If you grab Stanley Cup in front of me, I ain't stopping you. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm not on. jumping in front of Have you. Fun. No. You ever yeah. sat inside the actual Stanley Cup, Brad? Oh, I was baptized in it. Oh, I could <laughs> see that. That's a video. That's a power move I'd right there. I'd watch the shit out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, shark attack. Did you hear that story of like last one? Don't look up this video, Byron, because I, I heard it's graphic. But oh. this guy was attacked by a shark in Australia, and he filmed it. Oh, but his he own lost, shark attack? He Did he lose his leg? Yeah, he lost his leg. Yeah, yeah, I know. His own shark? And he's I'm like, oh, mad- I gotta get the GoPro on me. Okay, so there was a scene, and I think it was Zoolander 2. Yeah, I saw Zoolander 2. I did too. Uh, it, right in the beginning, Justin Bieber gets murdered, and right before he dies, 
he's taking an Instagram photo and he's like choosing the correct filter. That's right. Yeah. Like he's scrolling through the filter. That's he's like, no, no. <laughs> it was a joke. Now it's real. Yeah. Now that's that's just a documentary. That's what people. If you're filming your own shark attack where you lose a leg, you you. If, if I'm getting shark attack, I'm I'm trying to remember every weird video I've seen of like, all right, punch him in the nose. Do I run scared? Do I do I like like what animal? Right. It's like, do you get big? What? Well, if that's the case. I'm fucked. But like like, I gotta frame this shot. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. I don't understand that at all. Just you're, a shark is biting your leg, and, and 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 you're like, should I do regular or landscape horizontal? <laughs> like like what? Fucking hell! Yeah, I'll get tell out, you though, get out that of the shark's guy, mouth. That guy has a great and promising future as a wedding photographer <laughs> because people go like, "Look, they say it may rain, and I really mm -hmm. need to know that you can handle this. If it, <laughs> don't, don't worry. I got it. I got. Well, I'm just saying, some people with the rain coming down mm -hmm. might feel like." Believe me, yeah. <laughs> trust me. Yeah, I'm done. I, I can do this. more extreme circumstances than a little bit of rain. A little bit of rain's can... not gonna. Kill All right, me. now remember, I got a sister-in-law who can be a little bit fussy sometimes <laughs> when she drinks. That, that I can handle a I little stress. Yeah. Do not worry. I will not stop clicking those pictures. Does your sister-in-law have razor <laughs> sharp <laughs> teeth that replace themselves after they're embedded <laughs> in my femur? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a break. Joshua Green. Green is uh, next. He's uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author and has lots of really interesting thoughts. Starfish, Brad Williams, that's the name of the special. Yeah. And uh, it's on Veeps. Yes, and sir. it's also, you can, s Brad has a lot of live dates. Go to bradwilliamscomedy.com. <laughs> yes. Over 70 dates in 2024. Hell and yeah counting we'll be announcing uh, more countries uh Ooh. so yes uh, uh bradwilliamscomedy.com get your tickets and it's a different hour than the special starfish which is on veeps so come on out and enjoy all right we'll talk to joshua green author and thinker right after this it's time to check adam's voicemail Hey, Adam, when I am talking to a bartender and I'm trying to ask him for a strong pour, I like to say, pour me a drink like you hate your boss. Try that and see how it works. Thanks. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. I'm going to try that. Give jo me a bottle. Joshua Green is on. Um, he's got a book. It's uh, out very soon. It's called The Rebels, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and uh, The Struggle for a New American Politics. Uh, it's available wherever you find finer books. It'll be this Tuesday, January 9th. He's written many books, and we're interested in getting his opinions. Good to see you, Joshua. Good to be with you. Um, it's an interesting time politically and uh so what's the thesis of the book, the uh, the broad picture of the book? The, the book is looking at my last book was about the rise of right wing populism. Um, you know, I knew Steve Bannon and Donald Trump way back when. So when Trump got elected, I kind of wrote a book about how it had all happened and how this thing had exploded. Um, so for this book, like I wanted to write about uh, populism on the left. And so the conceit of the book is that the financial crisis in 2008, like that was the great like earthquake event in American politics that 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 sparked this populist uprising that gave rise to Trump on the one hand, but it also gave rise to these group of politicians on the left. The other guy I hung out with uh, a bit on the campaign trail in 2016 uh, was Bernie Sanders. People were just crazy for Bernie Sanders, including a lot of Trump voters. So for this book, you know, with the election coming up in November and with Biden having basically kind of like smuggled in a lot of Bernie and Warren's economic plans and his reelection kind of riding on it. I wanted to do a big, deep look at the rise of these kind of left wing populist politicians who really didn't exist before the financial crisis and before like Elizabeth Warren came on the scene in 2009, 2010. Well, I always constantly ask the question of how much of what they say do they believe? Like <laughs> how much of what Bernie Sanders says does he believe? Because 
these guys, we were talking about this yesterday, whether it's uh, Barack Obama or whomever, um, they talk about this all the time, but they end up yeah. having multiple homes and bank accounts that are worth millions of dollars and flying privately. Mm-hmm. Now, I, and I don't, I'm not saying Bernie Sanders, and Bernie Sanders has a few homes and does a, a couple okay. homes. Yep. yep right. Yep. But what, I, what I'm kind of saying is, is you can go, well, what about Trump? That's a fine question, but Trump never talks about it. He brags that he flies privately and that his house, (laughs) he argues that his house is worth more, not less. So how are, you know, what is, and and does Bernie really think it'll work? Like if he could just implement his plan. So, all right, to answer your question, like you notice none of these guys go around wearing like lie detectors or anything like that. So like, you know, newsflash, there's a lot of lot of bullshit in my line of work in Washington politics. But having said that, like I've been around long enough that I knew Bernie before he was Bernie when he was just this kind of crotchety, angry old congressman who nobody nobody really liked. I mean, people in his own party didn't like him because he would never cooperate. He was always like the lone vote against what everybody else was for. Like, I, I, I think he's honest. I think he was honest then. Like, he's never kind of changed his tune. He's never, you know, no, I, his hair or tried to look presentable like a normal politician. So I, I think he's got a level of integrity that a lot of other people don't. I agree. Um, no, I think, I think look, Bernie look, Sanders look, he is also, honest. He also, yeah. I'll, 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 give you, I'll, I'll give the doubters this one. He also got a taste of kind of the high life, you know, once he really kind of took off as a candidate and, like, he likes flying private. Like he likes having a lake house, right? When you're like a, you know, broke socialist congressman before you're a celebrity, you didn't have any of those things. And like, you know, there's a reason Trump's got a half a dozen houses and all, you know, rich people do. I think Bernie's got a touch of that too. But in fairness, like he hasn't really changed his message. He would tax himself. I don't think Trump would. Yeah, I I tend to think Bernie Sanders is sincere. I, I think he's misguided mm-hmm. and I don't think any of his policies would work, but I definitely think he's sincere. I don't think Hillary Clinton is sincere. I, I feel like she's just going to say, I don't think Joe Biden's sincere. I think they'll just say yeah. whatever everyone else is saying well, or wants them to say. Totally. You know, I used to have an, an, an argument with Elizabeth Warren Stafford. I used to be a columnist for the Boston Globes. I kind of got to know her off the record. You know, she's a character in the book and I kind of tell the story of her rise because she was really the first Democrat after the financial crisis just to come out and call bullshit. Like she was the first Democrat to publicly go after Barack Obama and Tim Geithner and Larry Summers and the whole Wall Street crowd and say like, yeah, this isn't working. You're screwing over the American middle class. And so there's kind of big debate in nerd Washington circles about, well, like Warren should run against Hillary. And the debate was like, you know, I thought she should run because, you know, she really does kind of care about these issues. But getting to your point on insincerity, like Hillary Clinton was a cipher, right? So if Warren got in, she's either going to beat Clinton and be the nominee, in which case, you know, she could go off and run and maybe be president or more likely Hillary would beat her. But in order to beat her, she'd sort of like be like a mosquito and kind of like suck out her whole agenda because it was popular. Like people, people were populist. People cared about that. You saw that later on with Bernie and with Trump. So she should have run because you're right. I mean, Hillary didn't really have like any kind of core political beliefs. And had Warren decided to run in 2016, like I think Hillary would have been a lot more populist, maybe enough so that she wouldn't have gotten beat by Donald Trump. But like clearly the American mood on the left and the right in 2016 was like we're tired of these fake establishment dynastic politicians like Jeb Bush and like Hillary. And like we're going to go in a different direction. What's your take on AOC? I think my take on AOC will not be popular on the left. Um, I I think she's a really good politician. Like she, to to get elected and to knock off Joe Crowley, the the old Irish guy she beat, who everybody in my world thought was going to be the next Democratic Speaker of the House after Nancy Pelosi, you know, to, to go in as like a nobody millennial and kind of organize and get your people out and get that guy knocked off was a big achievement. But I thought she was going to blow up on the launch pad. You know, when she got to Washington, made a ton of waves, occupied Pelosi's office, all the kind of socialists on Twitter got like really excited and this and that. But like nothing happened for, like for six months. She didn't really achieve anything, like ton of followers. You know, she would do live stream on Instagram and everybody loved her, but she wasn't getting 
any of her policies kind of put into place. And she's a, she's a serious person and she wanted to. And so my take on, on, on AOC is that she adapted. Like she, she fired a lot of her kind of most radical staffers. And instead of going and occupying people's offices, she got together with Bernie, she got together with Warren, and she got together with some of the Biden people and figured out, look, if I want to have this kind of climate legislation, it's got to go through Joe. And one of the things Biden passed, nobody on the left really wants to kind of credit him for, is he, he passed a $300 billion climate bill, biggest in the history of the U.S. It was just marketed as the Inflation Reduction Act and infrastructure and all the stuff that wouldn't excite right-wingers because he didn't want it to seem like it was this radical left-wing environmental policy. But look, she got a big chunk of what she wanted. It's not a Green New Deal, but it's 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 an advance. And I think she's smart for having recognized that. And I think all three of my politicians, I, you know, I don't know if they care <laughs> if they cater to your viewers or not, but like all three of these politicians are kind of smart enough to know they're getting what they want through Biden. He's enacting a lot of the stuff. And so all three of them could have run against Biden in 2024. God knows Biden's not the strongest candidate, but all three of them have chosen not to because they realize even if the press doesn't, even if a lot of people on the left don't, that Biden is carrying important parts of their agenda and getting it done. How it it seems like there was a little bait or Biden and switch that took place. That I, it was presented yeah. that he's going to be the centrist, sort of middle of the road, old totally. Uncle Joe, slow and steady. He's been there. We're going to stop all the vitriol and all the tweets and all the attacks, and we're going to steer this country back toward unity and a kind of basic agenda that we sort of remember. Think Bill Clinton, you know. Think about yep. his agenda and what a sort of sensible middle of the road Democrat used to be. That's what we're bringing back with Joe Biden. And it just doesn't seem like that has been the agenda. But what do you am I wrong on that take? And then I think I think, no, you're, you're totally right on that take. But I would I would split it up a little different. I'd say you're, you're, you're mostly right, but a little bit wrong. Yeah, he totally look, he ran as I'm the safe, normie, old, bland guy. Nobody hates I'm the safest pair of hands to pry Donald Trump out of the White House. Because at the end of the day, as much as a lot of Democrats and progressives like things like raising taxes on the wealthy, breaking up Goldman Sachs, that kind of thing, what they really wanted was to get Donald Trump out of the White House. And Biden was the best vehicle for doing that. Now, to your point, the thing that was so surprising about Biden to me, I've been a Washington political reporter for 20 years. So I used to cover Biden when he was a Delaware senator. He was so in the pocket of Wall Street that people used to jokingly call him the senator from corporate America because Delaware is like the center of all the corporate stuff. He ended up embracing like large parts of the Bernie Warren economic populist agenda. Right. And like most presidents like or most most nominees. Right. Once you win the nomination in the primary, like the classic movies, like you pivot to the center because that's the safest thing to do. Biden ended up pivoting to the left because he wanted to win those those liberal voters. And as president, he wound up putting in place like huge parts of like the Warren Bernie agenda, right? We got, I mean, admittedly, it was a, you know, it was a middle of a giant financial crisis because of COVID, but we got stimulus and beefed up unemployment benefits and like eviction freezes and student loan forgiveness and like small business loans. People were like throwing money at the middle class. That's what economic populism is. That's what economic populists want. And, you know, I think it's to his credit that he did that. Because if you go out, you know, I, I spend like half my time out on the trail at political events talking to voters. I and mean, the fact is, most voters I meet think Biden is like a wheezing corpse who isn't even pulling the strings of his own presidency. And the fact that he's basically even with Trump is a testament to the power of that kind of brand of left wing populism that people like Bernie uh, and, and, and Warren, that, that he took it from. The, the one smart thing Biden has done where I would disagree with you is he's left aside the part of like leftyism where you're inventing new pronouns or you're defending the president of Harvard for plagiarism because the mean conservatives are being tough on her. I think Biden was smart enough to recognize that that brand of identity politics wasn't going to play with people outside the left. And like, look, the guy's a politician. He wants to get elected president. And he was smart enough to know, you know, not to foreground that part of the agenda.
Well, he did have Dylan Mulvaney over to the White House, and he does race. Did he? I think he did. Oh, we shit, can look it up. <laughs> All right. He had All right. Well, most of the Dylan time, most over, of the time, he's, he's kept his shit And he together. does the race hustle as much as he can. So he does... He does a lot of race hustling, a he, lot. He, but he's more, but he's like more subtle about it than like the crazy activists on Twitter and the people, you know, all white people are evil and all this kind of stuff. Like he's 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 not a guy that's going to frighten your grandmother. Like that's the way. No, I think. but I mean, he says uh, white supremacists are the greatest danger this country faces. Oh yeah, over but that's just again. that's just a knock on. I mean, he's just trying to radicalize Trump and make him seem like the boogeyman. Like that's, I get it, but he still does. He does a fair amount of race hustling. I will hey, say it's that. Politics. It's politics. Especially, I, I for, especially just, for a Democrat. Look, it it's, it's bothers called, me that there's so much of that. It's well, but it's, it's called mind. catering to your base. You know, I, mean, I, I guess I just feel like it's destructive. But, yeah. I, but I get it. I mean, you know, I got Gavin Newsom over here. You know, the people are like, he's destroying California. Yeah, I know. But he's just doing what politicians do. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe you should think about the people in California a little bit and a little less uh, doing what politicians do yeah he's thinking about getting on tv and running right, right right well what do you what do you think and we can find out if dylan showed up he, to was. The White. he was at the white house so what is your take bringing up uh, gavin newsom you know i gotta say selfishly i'd kind of like him to be president so he would fucking leave california <laughs> and we could get back to rebuilding it but then i realized he would take his policies nationwide and probably destroy the country so but he's lurking in the shadows, always saying he's not running, but acting like he's he's running. And so you shouldn't believe anything Gavin Newsom says, because I've interviewed him before. And he he doesn't lie in a traditional sense. He lies in a more elevated sense. Uh, but he still lies. That's all he does. Well, but he's also I mean, he's also I in the White House. And- yes. A likely Democratic nominee who's, I can't even remember what 80 he is, you know, like 80, 82, 80, whatever, whatever it is, you know, the actuarial numbers suggest that like, you know, a non-zero chance that maybe somebody other than Biden yeah. will wind up having to be the Democratic so, nominee. So, so why not kind of. Oh, I agree. Ready. Oh, no, he's he's politically savvy for sure. Like in a, in a weird way, I, it's a weird compliment because whenever yeah, yeah. Gavin Newsom's name comes up, everyone goes, God, he's a duplicitous, destructive fucking coward. And they go, but he's a great politician. He really knows what he's doing. <laughs> and I'm like, geez, I call me old fashioned, but I would like a great politician to get the trains to run on time and have school systems run a little better, not just be a, you know, a snake oil salesman. But yeah. we got Biden. His poll numbers are not great. There's still a whole sort of chapter two of the Hunter Biden stuff and the Ukraine and Russia. And there's there's more meat on that bone than I think a lot of people realize. And there'll be more, I'm sure. So he's got his difficulties. Um, then there's, you know, Gavin Newsom. Then there's the people who think Michelle Obama is going to parachute in at the, at the 12th or 11th hour. Uh and, and then there's some people who think Trump's going to be indicted. Like, what? What's your take on what the next year is going to be like? I don't. I mean, it, it's it's going. You know, I covered 2016, and I, I always used to, like my line when 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 my book came out after 2016 was like n- like no cycle, no year will ever be as crazy as 2016 was, and like already it's going to be in 2024. I mean, Trump has you know, more criminal charges than like the villain in a Batman movie. And, you know, Biden, God knows what kind of shape he's going to be in. So, yeah, there's a non, e- even though these guys seem like they're going to be the inevitable nominees for their party, there's a non-zero chance that they get tripped up by health or by prosecutors or by like, I don't know, some natural disaster we can't even kind of envision yet. And so, yeah, it's going to be crazy. But even if those two guys are the nominee, it's it's a 50-50 country. People are angry i mean on the left on the right i go out on the campaign trail and people are just like steaming mad either at biden or at trump or or whatever so i don't know i mean like you know the thing that i keep coming back to again and again and the reason i decided to make kind of write about you know the rebels as i call them the rise of kind of left populism is whether you're at like a trump event or kind of whether you're out in middle America at a, at a democratic event, like, and you talk to people who aren't like the crazy activists, right? You can recognize them a mile away with their t-shirts and their weird hats and all that. You go talk to like a normal working person, like, hey, what are you concerned about? 
And a lot of it has to do with the same kind of thing. Like, I want to keep my job. I'm worried about the economy. I want my kid to be able to get a job here. Like, what, what it all comes down to is kind of the lived experience of, like, just normal middle-class Americans. They're the ones who are going to decide, all right, I don't like either one of these guys. They both seem like clowns, but I'm going to vote. Which one of them is going to do a better job, like, keeping the country together and making my life better in the next four years? And to me... Biden's only hope is to take the populist playbook and run as hard with it as he can and just to say, look, you know, I may be old, but unemployment is down. The stock market is up like, you know, things are going in the right direction. You've got money in your bank account. Yeah, everybody's angry and shouting at each other on social media, but like things are trending in the right direction. And I, I work at Business Week magazine. It's my day job. So I'm surrounded all day long by finance nerds and bombarded with economic data and like all the economic numbers really do say like it's about to be morning in America again. So I could envision is is it bad shape as he's in, I could envision a path to Biden winning reelection. Like if he sticks to kind of the right themes and things go in the right direction for him. But it's also not hard to see kind of Trump coming back and just swatting away all these prosecutors and saying, I'm going to make America great again. Joe Biden ruined it. Vote for me. And here we are with, you know, Trump administration round two. I think Biden's going to focus more on the losing the democracy and Trump as a dictator yeah. with a sprinkling of race hustling coming I in. Know, I don't I don't know yeah. that he can. I don't think he can help himself. Like that's Here. that's the whole thing. I'm with you. I wish the Democrats were just nuts and bolts. Let's talk about the economy. Let's talk about jobs. Let's talk about the border and yep. what we're going to do yep. about it and so on and so forth. But they cannot help themselves from getting into all the we're going to turn this into a, de- a banana dictatorship and we're going to lose our democracy and with this, then some race hustling on top of it. So like, OK, so I do. So I'm, here's my roundabout answer that I think you're right. And I think that Democrats can't help them. So I do. I think this kind of save democracy stuff isn't a net plus because, look, anybody who's really concerned about that and the Democratic framing of it, they're already voting for Joe Biden. Right. Like the guy who can't feed his kid and loses his union job isn't really thinking about that. He's thinking about other stuff. I think all of this stems from a kind of like like, look, the story in my book is kind of the rise sequentially of, you know, uh, Warren first and then Bernie. But like both of them come together at the end of the book in 2020 Democratic primaries, right? They both run. You get your pick of like which lefty populist do you want? And they both fail. And I think the reason they both failed is because Trump poisoned the brains of a lot of liberals, like a lot of people I know and am related to, including including Warren and Sanders. Like they started out and what they did right was to talk about economic populism. That was that was Warren's first thing when she came on the scene. That was the core of Bernie's message when he first ran for president in 2015 and 2016. I think that was right. But once Trump became president, I think that among these lefties, it, it created like there was this moral imperative to take the maximalist position against Trump on every issue, not just economics, on everything, like opening borders and abolishing ICE and you know, getting rid of private health insurance and putting in Medicaid for it just scared everybody. And, and and people, you know, people in 2020 decided, like, I don't want big structural change. I want somebody who's going to get rid of Donald Trump. And that's why they picked Joe Biden. And I, I think the further like. The thing that attracts majoritarian support for Democrats is when they foreground these economic populist ideas. And like the thing that's sort of maddening to see with Biden is like, He's actually done a good job. Yeah, inflation is high and people are angry about it. But, you know, the beginning of my book, I said earlier, like the financial crisis in 08, right? That was the big earthquake. It took seven years for America to recover all the jobs it lost. Biden, by following this populist playbook in the first year of his presidency, all the stimulus and all the support, we got those jobs back in two years. Like unemployment is is like as low as it's been since Eisenhower. Like nobody nobody pays attention to this stuff because it's not it's not sexy and people like to just shout about culture war stuff. But like he's got the record there if he can kind of, you know, get up out of his chair and get out into the country and sort of like sell it. But I'm not sure he can. And the thing that Biden seems to want to be selling this week is, you know, to go to Philadelphia and talk about saving our democracy and, and Trump is a threat and I don't know. Maybe that works. But like, I don't see that as being like the kind of like 
big tent Democratic message that's going to connect not just with Democrats who hate Trump, but with like independents and kind of non MAGA Republicans. And I think that's what Biden needs to do. Yeah. And I kind of wish he would, but I don't see any indication that he's going to get back to that or that people are going to let him get back to that, which is a more interesting question. Like he may yeah. Yeah. want to get back to that, but. And I'm not talking about people pulling the string, but I'm just talking about the people around him who are younger and more progressive may not let him get back to that message. Oh, I thought you were talking about Trump, who's more nimble and aggressive. It can yank the conversation to be about whatever he wants. I mean, that's the other thing that Biden's got to go against. It's not just that that he's got to kind of, you know, rise above crazy leftists, but like. Trump's going to come out and say something wild and we in the media are all going to go bananas about it. And it's, it's tough for, for Biden, you know, who isn't as, who isn't as kind of sharp and aggressive as he was maybe 10 years ago to kind of come out and seize the narrative back and like talk about the economy. I, I'm not really sure he can do it. I don't, well, that's the I, challenge for Biden. I don't, I don't assume that Biden would debate Trump. Uh, but did, did, would you anticipate, let's just say they were both the parties uh, of, uh, at the top of each party going, Trump was out of jail and, you know, Biden uh, wasn't, uh, didn't fall off a stage or something. Would you, I wouldn't assume that Biden would agree to that. Would you? I, I think Biden would have to agree to it. Look, the, the, the context for this race is going to be Biden's age. And if there's a debate, if Trump says, I'm going to do the debate and Biden says, I'm not, it's just it's it's politically unsustainable for Biden. But but here's the other thing, like back in 2020, <clears throat> everybody, you know, Trump and Bannon and all those guys were like, oh, you know, Biden, he's too, he's too old. He's kind of losing his marbles and this and that. And they lowered the bar so far for Biden that when he did get out there and debate Trump, like he won just by showing up and not like falling over, or like dribbling on himself or something like that. Like they made it easy for Biden. The same the same thing has happened in this time. Like all Biden's got to do is get up, keep his shit together for, you know, 45 minutes. And look, he's got a lot he can talk about. He can say, hey, folks, because that's all he said. Folks, <laughs> open open your 401k. How's it doing today? I mean, I looked at I looked at mine last week at the end of the year. and like, wow, like pretty good. Like. You know, how's your, you know, your nephew or whatever finally got a job? Like anybody can get a job now. You know, mortgage rates are coming down. Um, you know, consumer sentiment is turning around. Like it's morning in America, whatever, whatever. I mean, he's got something to sell. So if you can't even, if you don't even have the wherewithal to kind of like show up and make the pitch, mm. why is anybody going to buy anything from you? Why are they going to, yeah. why are they, they going to give you another term? Well, I'll sort of, you know, push back a little bit. And that's not apples to apples, but we just had an election in Arizona where they wouldn't, the one woman wouldn't debate the other woman and their names mm -hmm, are escaping mm -hmm. me right now. Carrie and Lake. everyone made a yeah, kind yeah, of Carrie Lake, right. Carrie, right they right. wouldn't. And, and yeah. everyone kind of made a big deal out of it. Even folks that were sort of friendly on the left are kind of interviewing her going, you should debate. Why yeah. won't you debate? And she's like, I don't need to debate because she can do the thing where they go, I'm not going to debate a dictator. Like I'm not going to lower myself to have a conversation with the Hitler's grandson. Um, you make it righteous. And then she won. So she got yeah, a ton right, of let shit. Me, let me amend my answer just a bit. Like <laughs> nine times out of ten, yes. I'm right. Right. And you're wrong. That was that was look, here here's here's the here's the proviso. If your opponent is so batshit and they're lighting themselves on fire with conspiracy stuff the way Carrie Lake was, then sure, say you're not gonna debate, leave the spotlight on them. I think you can get away with that in like a governor's race. There is no way you can get away with that in a presidential race when the entire media for the entire like world, you know, is focused on this and has questions about your age. Well, I'm not even making. I just don't think Biden could get away with it. I'm just making a counter argument. I don't even believe myself, but I will say this: um, I, I, you could definitely make the argument that Trump is batshit crazy and he can just go hang himself with his late night tweeting and stuff like that. Number one. Number two, when you say the entire media, it's not like the New York Times, the L.A. Times, Reuters, CNN, MSNBC would get on 
Biden for not debating. They would support uh, him. They no, would. They're they're no, that bad. No. They're that bad. You don't think the New York no, Times? You think no the New York way. Times no, would call Biden a coward? Let me, let me give you a little the New York Times. Washington. Seriously, let me give you a little inside Washington perspective. <clears throat> the thing that drives the Biden White House absolutely crazy when it comes to the press is any focus on like Biden and his age, like every newspaper, every outlet, including Bloomberg, my own, we're all running these stories on Biden's age and, and polling on it. And like every week there's a new poll, like people think he's too old. Democrats think he's too old. Old people think he's too old. Young people think he's too old. It drives these guys nuts. They hate it. Like the world doesn't work in the way that a lot of conservatives think it does, where like the Times and the mainstream press take their marching orders from the Biden White House. Well, they're coming and, around. And let me let me just let me that. tell you, like, clip this, save this, have me back on in, you know, October or whatever when the debates come around. If Biden doesn't debate Donald Trump, he will get absolutely crucified by the mainstream press because it's all gonna be stories about does he have the mental fitness to even get up there on stage and their concerns and their polls? And like, it's it's too much baggage for, for Biden to carry to kind of not do that. And the mainstream media is not going to bail him out on that one. I agree in the sense that the mainstream media has definitely started to shift a little bit. Um, maybe the mainstream media in 2020 wouldn't have been as aggressive about it because their goal was to get Trump out. But they've definitely, definitely some cracks appearing in their support for Biden. And there definitely have been more sort of negative stories about Biden in the mainstream media in the last six months than there were in the you know previous four years. True. I mean, that's also but that's also because th th there isn't going to be a Democratic primary. I mean, these kind of like weirdos like, you know, I don't know, Dean Phillips running against him, but Biden doesn't have a real challenger, right? Like he could have been challenged from the left by, you know, Warren or Bernie or any of my characters. And but they all decided, no, like we're we're sticking with Biden. And so if the press doesn't have a race to cover, they're just going to focus on the one guy who's left. And it's not all, you know, roses like they're going to look at his age. They're going to look at his, you know, his policies. They're going to look at the problems with his vice president. They're going to look at all the different demographic groups in America that are souring on Biden. They're going to look at blacks and Latinos moving over to Trump and they're going to spend all day. I mean, this is the complaint of the Biden White House, you know, press staff. They spend all day long, um, you know, covering Biden's faults and not really writing that much about Donald Trump. Do they uh, does Biden stick with Kamala Harris? Yeah, there's no there's no way you, another conservative like conspiracy theory. Look, if you talk to the people around Biden, like truth, like dose them with truth serum and be like, if you could, would you swap her out for somebody else? Like the answer would be yes. But there's absolutely no way to do that without creating like a huge fight in the party over race, gender. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, all, uh, like, yeah. How are we going to do that? No, I how love it. I love it when people get bitten by their own snake. Yeah. That's and my... so look, the Democrats are riding with with Joe and Kamala, like unless one or both of them has a heart attack. And and you don't think that no last minute surprises from The Rock, no, no. other than like a health surprise or so, or you know, America getting hit by a meteorite or something. No, I don't. I don't think there's no there's no political shenanigans are going to happen like that on the Democratic side because they're not organized enough to pull it off. If they were. Biden wouldn't be running for a second term. Like all you have to do is look at him and look at look at the, you know, poll numbers he gets to see that like maybe not the strongest candidate in the world, and yet <laughs> they're 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 rolling with him anyway. Last question for you, Joshua. Um, who do you you know? I look at a lot of these guys on the uh, Republican side. I like. A lot of stuff Vivek says, a lot, a lot of stuff that uh, RFK Jr. says, uh, a lot of stuff Nikki Haley says. You know, they're, they're not perfect, but I do like a lot of what some of them say. And they're relatively young, you know, and I think, you know, like you see a guy like Vivek and he's very polarizing, but he's super articulate and he's sharp. And I'm like, is there a play? And he's young. Like, is there a place? I know everyone says they're running now, but is there a place down the road for some of these people? I, you know, I don't I don't think there is. I mean, the impression I get like out on the 
trail with Republican crowds. Like people, people know they like Trump, first of all. So like nobody's really shopping for a replacement except like the kind of never Trumpers. But but they also know that all those folks you mentioned, like they think of them as like throne sniffers. Like they could never say a bad word about Trump. And he's sort of, he's like, remember Scooby-Doo and like Mini-Doo or what was a little Scrappy-Doo? Scrappy-Doo. Scrappy Doo. And then there's Godzuki. Scrappy- Su- they're, they're all That's another Scrappy one. Doos. They're all, they're all, they all want to be Robin to Trump's Batman. And on some level, like it's, it's pathetic and you can't mask the fact that it's sort of pathetic. So if Republican voters were out there saying, gee, I love Trump, but he's too old and, you know, he's probably going to jail going to have to pick somebody. No, younger. I'm saying down the road, just uh, yeah. 10 years from now. It's, you know, it's too hard to say if Trump, if Trump loses in November, there's going to have to be a reckoning in the Republican party because like, if you can't beat Joe, if you go over for two against Joe Biden, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you, you like you need, you need, you need a new GM and a new head coach. Right. <laughs> And so there's going to have to be some kind of change. Obviously, like generationally, there will have to be because Trump will be like 90 by then right. uh, and maybe in jail. Um, but th- there's also going to have to be some kind of a shift where like Republicans can kind of attract some of the people that Trump has alienated. Like in, in the end of the day, you have to be able to get like 51 percent of America um, if, if you want to be able to win the White House on like a consistent basis. So I think what it will probably be is like a Republican governor, like not somebody who's in Washington, not somebody who's been around like forever and kind of annoys everybody like Ted Cruz, like all those guys will run. But I don't I don't see it being somebody like that. I think it's got to be somebody fresh, somebody from like middle America or the mm-hmm. South and somebody who doesn't have like the baggage, even of like a Ron DeSantis or some of the people running this time. I think that's a pretty astute observation. The book, The Rebels. Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, AOC, and the struggle for a new American politics. It's available. That's this Tuesday, January 9th, wherever you find finer books. And shoot Joshua Green a tweet at Joshua Green. It's good to speak to you, Joshua. Likewise. You can have me back if I'm wrong about all this. I'll take well, my beat. We'll, uh, we'll mark the tape and uh, we'll have you... <laughs> We'll have you back, and uh, we'll see. We'll see how it panned out. I look uh, forward to it. Uh, good to see you, my friend. And you can go. I'm going to be in Arizona Friday and Saturday doing four shows at uh, Copper Blues. And uh, one of the shows is sold out, but there's still a few tickets left. Then it's off to Solana Beach, and uh, that is at the Belly Up. And the early show is sold out for that, but there's a late show. That'll be Sunday of Fitz Dog with us and Jody Miller. So you go to adamcurl.com for all the live shows. And until next time, this is Adam Curl for Brad Williams and Joshua Green and Chris Maxipata saying, Mahalo. Mahalo.